lots of people um, treat warts with homeopathic medicine, and we all know that it works, those of us that do classical homeopathic medicine. But the question is, is there any kind of a scientific rationale for doing it? Uh, for treating uh, warts with homeopathic medicine? Uh, I mean, I've actually Googled, you know, uh, clinical trials and treatment of warts. And the trouble is all it comes up is maybe two or three really poorly done studies. Only one was done by real classical homeopaths. Most were done by conventional people who just give a this for a that. And then they say that it doesn't work. And then there was one pretty good study and it was a negative study. So, so you know, when you're talking to conventional medicine people, um, you know, they may ask you, well, isn't there any kind of a scientific rationale? Look, at it is all it is, it's just negative studies. Well, here's what I found, um, that there actually is um, a scientific rationale for the treatment of warts with homeopathic medicine, and it's found in the animal model. There's an animal model, there's actually several, there's actually bovine papillomavirus, but um, this is actually the animal model of a canine oral papillomavirus. And if you look in the upper right, you're pretty hard pressed to actually, you know, see where the dog is. The poor dog, uh, it's, this is the nose, this is like the side of the, the uh, head over here. It's pretty much overrun by oral uh, viral papillomas. And in humans, we treat human papillomavirus, HPV, you all know about that. This is called canine oral papillomavirus or CPV1. And just like what we have in humans, it is a double, um, a double strand of DNA virus. And this is most common, I'm told, I don't have any clinical um, experience with it, um, not being a veterinarian, but they say that it happens mainly in young dogs uh, under the age of four and especially within the first year of life. And um, it affects mainly um, the oral cavity and the lips, the mouth. So basically um, on the uh, mucosal surfaces, and the good thing is eventually when the dogs develop a strong enough host cellular immunity, then they start spontaneously regressing. But the trouble is for the first year or so of life, um, I'll use the pointer here so he people can see. Oh, yeah, I don't think we can enlarge that. Um, okay. That's fine. But um, you could just Google oral papillomavirus and you'll see a whole bunch of um, um, images of, of what you can see. But anyway, um, while the dog is struggling to develop the cell mediated immunity um, and for waiting for them to um, go away on their own, it can, as you can see in this case over here, uh, interfere with uh, activities of daily living like eating, breathing, and, and sometimes they can bleed and become infected. So, so look at this. I found this. It just came out on the internet and if you look up here as uh, January of this year, there's a really nice double blind placebo control study and the treatment of warts in dogs. It was just fantastic. So I raised my water bottle and a toast to Dr. Raj, Pavel Raj Kumar et al. And um, they really did a good study. Jane, Jane Doyle made a comment. She says she sees those oral facial warts young dogs and young horses after vaccination at Windows 631 and Very interesting. And that's also interesting because um, this is a study which uses, um, it was a combo treatment versus placebo. And it just so happens if you look a little closer that the combo, one of the ones just like one of our um, attendees just discussed is Thuya. And of course, Thuya is probably one of the number one remedies for oral mucosal warts in humans. That's actually a rubric. Um, so, so you gave a combination room. Yes. So um, the so eight dogs got placebo, which was the same amount of milliliters of distilled water, same appearance and everything. Group B was the eight dogs who got uh, it was a combo, and it also was virtually uh, uh, identical the way you looked at it, just like clear water. It was a uh, um, wet doses of sulfur thirty, all in thirty, thuya, graphitis, and striatum. And it was randomized one on one, so eight and eight. And um, this is what they found. Um, so, anyway, um, to get into the study, the dogs had to have oral papillomatosis, and they couldn't have had any previous treatment. And uh, what they did was they gave them either the distilled water, and it was randomized um, and placebo controlled, and they looked at distilled water 
uh, twice a day for 15 days versus the combo liquid wet doses twice a day for 15 days. And they evaluated them um, through 12 months. So this is a really good study. It had long, long follow-up and everything. And they actually clinically scored them. Um, and you can see here, uh, they looked at them when they first started, day five, day seven, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to five months. And the cool thing was it shows that there was a significant reduction in the warts reflected by the clinical score, highly significant in comparison to the placebo group. Um, and so basically, I'll show you the, the, the graphs in a second, but their conclusion was that the combination of the homeopathic drugs given orally to the dogs hastened the regression of the uh, oral warts, and they felt it was safe and effective. So for those of you who like to see it more visually, um, there's a huge canyon, a huge gap between the two as they followed them through about five months or so of evaluation. The placebo guys were here and the homeopathic were here. And you can see that while these work didn't change, didn't start changing until maybe around here. So they're slowly Love regressing, them. slowly regressing over, you know, all the eight dogs regressed after 150 days, which is what you would expect in a healthy dog that starts developing their cell immune immunity. But look at this, this is like, this is like within two weeks, this is 14 right here, within two weeks they were all regressed. So I showed this to one of my friends who's a um, conventional dermatology professor at one of the local universities here in Chicago. And he, he's pretty hard to impress. And when he saw this, he said, hey, do you, he pulled out his, um, his smartphone. He said, do you mind if I take a picture of this? I've got this friend who's a DVM. I gotta show him, he's gonna, he's gonna wanna see this. So, so it only goes to show, if you want people in the world to wake up and smell the roses about homeopathic medicine, there's only two things you gotta do. You have to, one, you have to show them really good solid data. It doesn't have to be an N equals a million sample size. It could just be eight and eight like this. But if it's a well done study, the second thing is you got to show really, really good photos. And here's the photos. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect storm. If we have great clinical photos before and after of homeopathy doing its thing, and if you have great data, how can you shoot holes through that? You can't. And here it is. This is one of the dogs. This was in the group B, which was not the placebo. This, this, dog got the, um, the real homeopathics, you can see these um, prolific warts and here they are, and they've resolved. Um, and this is just like day five. So getting back to this one though, so you can see that um, over here in this, um, on the right, you can see that um, it's highly significant beginning at day five, all the way down to um, the 60th day, and then even the 90th day. Then after that, then your the placebo um, dog's immune system start kicking in and they start uh, catching up. And then here mm -hmm. at the very end, mm -hmm. down here, there's no difference at all because both of them, both sides have gotten better. So what do you think? They should, they should do a study with just studio. They should do a study <laughs> with just studio is what Dr. Shepard said. I agree, that's really interesting. That's the key point because uh, in a recent webinar, Jennifer Jacobs did a study on dengue or common uh, infectious diarrhea, childhood diarrhea, and used a combination remedy. And the study was negative. Right. And her comment was we didn't have someone on the ground who knew enough about that local area to pick good remedies to put in the combination. So we had a negative study. Uh -huh. So the key is if you're going to do a combination remedy, you better have the remedies in there. You better know, have homeopaths who are treating individual dogs and knowing which is the, the right remedy and make sure that those remedies that come up a lot are put in there. Exactly. So, I don't so maybe know. just do it alone, you get some more results. Maybe be, I don't, who knows? Wasn't there a product too that they were selling over the counter in, in pharmacies for warts? It was, it was through. Was it? Um, so what, in case you couldn't hear what Dr. Fiore was saying was that, um, and what Dr. Shepard was saying was, of course, if you're going to get a combo, make sure there's real clinical, um, classical homeopaths who are picking the four or the five, whatever is going to be in your combo, because if you just have lay people or, or conventional people do that, they might not pick the right ones. Um, but anyway, um, and the point was, well, what if we just did three of them? Well, yeah, I don't know Raj at Al, but I'd like to congratulate them. They did a great study. They really um, planned it really well. 
But I guess what I would say is I'm guessing that they wanted this to appeal to conventional people because, you know, we may have dedicated the rest of our lives to studying homeopathy and, and learning the right remedies, but you can't expect conventional people to spend a kind of time and effort into doing that. So the idea is why not make it easy for conventional, conventional people, pick the top four remedies, whatever that would, which would be better for warts. And it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. But no, I agree. If you could be specific with one, that's always the best. You brought up the point that you know, now in combination, maybe remedies are enhanced better than each other. So maybe if you did a study with just three alone, maybe the results would be even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know, possibly. But they certainly didn't antidote each other in this case. Okay, speaking of cases, this is from my practice, uh, dermatology practice in Tinley Park. So looking on the left here, this is not a picture of raw hamburger. This is a picture of one of the worst eczema patients I've ever seen in my life. And this poor lady has had atopic eczema since the age of six months of age. Now she's 75. So she's been on topical steroids on and off for 74 and a half years, give or take, you know, a few times when maybe she wasn't on it. And she has a very, very tough case. You can see, uh, let's see if I got pointers here. Um, you could see her hands and her forearm. That's all I chose to take pictures of, but she has it over about 60% of her body. She has it like from her like, you know, upper chest up, uh, face is awful, uh, legs, thighs, and lower trunk. Uh, like her mid, kind of like her upper abdomen and, and mid back is kind of spared. Hands and feet, I think, were scared. Everything else was just really, really bad. Wire and stuff. No, just, no. You know. uh, uh, Tim is uh, an astute observer, and you can see. Oops. Um, you can see what are all these these white things? Well, um, that's the trouble with teledermatology. You can't palpate, but in real life, you know, you put a glove on, you would really palpate. This is very thick, um, and these are all these verrucous papules. Hard to say. It's so inflamed. Either they're viral warts, which is unusual for somebody of that age. Most people's immune systems have kicked in and the warts have kind of gone away by the time you're in your 60s or 70s. But it very well could be warts, but I really think that they are flesh-colored um, uh, severed keratoses. But we'll find out, because if you find the right homeopathic similimum, not only should the eczema get better, but the warts should go away. So if they go away with the treatment, well, then they are warts. If they don't, most likely sub -cares. But anyway, so the point is, um, she's been on steroids pretty much her whole life. I mean, topical steroids. And um, she went to her chiropractic physician about eight weeks ago before I saw her. And the idea was um, her eczema was getting worse despite the best dermatologist conventional care. And in fact, they even gave her, um, let's see, I think she was on another medicine. But anyway, she, they gave her all kinds of topical steroids her conventional, uh, her, her uh, alternative medicine uh, practitioners gave her topical cannabigerol, CBG, um, probiotics, flaxseed oil is what I think I gave her and it didn't work. Uh, bland emollients, I think I switched her to unpetroleum jelly, it didn't work. She had had patch testing done, which showed she was uh, allergic to a bunch of things, um, but I suspect they were probably false positives because they get kind of an angry back syndrome. Sometimes patch testing isn't real, real good in people like this because they're so, their immune system was so hyped up that there might be false positives with the test. But it showed she was allergic to a lot of different things, uh, but weakly allergic to a bunch of them. She had already tried to not use those things and she still didn't get better. So in fact, she got worse. So her chiropractic physician astutely said, you know, I don't think the steroids are good for you. Let's get you off of it. Unfortunately, she flared up worse than she ever did in her entire life, which I mean, she's been pretty bad her entire life, but this is really, really bad. I think she was a little worse before. Um, so she's been off of steroids right here. This is like uh, eight weeks after she stopped. That was when I first saw her. And um, so the trouble is she's itching like crazy. Sometimes they say it burns as well. And um, she's like, okay, um, he sent me over here so we could fix your eczema. I'm like, oh boy, this is a tough one because um, you know the longer you've had a chronic disease, sometimes the harder it is, even if you find the right remedy, sometimes the harder it is to really manage it. So like if she were 13, that's good. She has a lot of her life. She has a lot of time on her side, you know, and as long as she's patient, you know, it might take two, three, four years, but you can get under control. Now, if you're 75, it might take 20 years to get under control uh, or you might never. 
In fact, there's a study that showed that 13% of people with this corticosteroid addiction syndrome, 13% ne even, uh, they never get cured. Um, and the trouble is, um, we'll show you the, the paper in a moment. The trouble is sometimes the withdrawal symptoms are so bad. It's like withdrawing from alcohol or cocaine. You know, it's so bad that the people just stop their rehab and they go back to using because they can't stand how dysphoric it feels not having the drug. So, <clears throat> should I type it in? I don't think I have to. My, my question is, are there any um, benefits to really slowly reducing it? That, as that's opposed a great to thought. stopping it? Just slowly, slowly reducing it as you try to treat homeopathically or adding other things? So Dr. Francine Burke's question is, so should you just, you know, go cold turkey or, you know, 100% stop or should you kind of wean off? Uh, intuitively, I would think that weaning them off would be a good thing. In fact, that's what I had advised her. I said, listen, um, I said, listen, you know, you're going to flare, you know, well, you've already flared. So and she's already flared like for eight weeks, but she was even flaring, you know, even more. So I said, well, um, it was the same thing I do with people that have inappropriately been using topical steroids on their face because somebody thought it was eczema, but really it was acne rosacea. And they get addicted to the topical steroids too. And and I always tell them, you're going to flare like crazy. You're not going to like it. So if they're in the public, if they have a job where they're public speakers or sales people or whatever, I usually say, why don't we get you on the lowest possible prescription steroid? Why don't we just wean you off of it for like a few days, use it every day. So we're going from your super high potency to like the low potency. Then every other day and over two weeks, just get off of it. And anecdotally, Francine, that's a great um, question. Um, I think they do better when you kind of wean them off slowly. That's what I try to do with her. But um, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm done with, you know, topical steroids. I want to go only natural. Uh, so I said, okay, you know. So anyway, so uh, wouldn't you know it, it was, wasn't a two or three hour visit because she didn't tell Debbie, my office manager, that she wanted homeopathic. So um, so I just, I, I said to myself, well, let me just ask about maybe seven or eight really key homeopathic questions. And, and if I can get a good fix on what the remedy is, maybe I'll try it. Otherwise, I'll just be honest with her and say, look, you know, you've got a complex case. You got to come back and we'll schedule two or three hours and we'll really get into it. So these are the questions I asked her. Um, she said she had lots of anxiousness, nervousness. She was just a very kind of anxious person. So right away, I'm thinking maybe of Ignatia. Um, she's a very quick thinker. Um, she seems to have ups and downs in terms of like her emotional status. But she says, and I never would have thought, but um, I said, you know, how much of anger do you have? How much you know, guilt? And she said, oh, she has like a plus seven mm -hmm. out of 10 guilt. She's really guilty. She really, really craves cheese pizza, um, cheese alone, and also chicken. Um, she loves salty snacks. Uh, she hates fish. She just likes breakfast. She doesn't really eat until about 11 o'clock. So if she gets hungry around then I'm thinking, hmm, maybe she's sulfur. I mean, she's, she's a historic individual. You know, um, uh, you know the, the hunger seems to be maybe worse at 11 a.m. But um, in general, most of her symptoms in terms of especially like low energy is around 3 p.m. So I'm thinking, well, maybe even sepia or something like that. Could she be a sepia? Um, sepias often crave sour foods and maybe dark chocolate and maybe not so much salty food. Salty would be maybe more nature mirror, I would be thinking. Um, what about chicken? Who craves chicken? So graffiti. So if she said, I hate sweets and I love chicken, that's the only type of meat I eat. Who else likes chicken? What? what? flags go off? Is it mainly just graffiti or you also like the chicken? It's pretty common around no, where we it's live. Not. It's not. There's only a couple of them. Under so Francine's food. looking it up. She's, she's looking food and up. Drinks, under food and drinks, under well, general food and drinks, chicken. So desires chicken. Okay, it, so chicken I have for, we have aggravates, versions, and desires. What desire? Um, desires would be paramyodatum, graphides, lycopodium, phosphorus, and cicali. Uh, so cicali, paramyodatum, those are not real common. Uh, phosphorus is common. Uh, lycopodium graphides. Um, she, she's kind of slender. She doesn't have the graphides kind of pudgy kind of body cavitus. But what about phosphorus? Now, uh, and let's see, what else is in there? You still um, can look under 
aggravate any of those remedies there in small groups like this could be indicated. So uh, um, that uh, uh, vasculinum, which is also tuberculinum. Oh, uh -huh. could be vasculinum. Um, uh, natrium neuroticum is in there as well. And, and which one is that? Oh, this is under aggravates there's two, vasculinum gryonia. Under aversion is vasculinum, natrium neuroticum, and sulfur. And under desires, we already said that. So but would aversion be helpful when she really craves to? It's a spectrum kind of thing. Oh, like a spectrum thing. Well, kind of like nature. Sometimes they hate fish, oh, sometimes they love fish so or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's well, that's a good point. Exactly. So what about phosphorus? Um, do phosphoruses, I thought they love fish, but can they hate fish too? Yeah. Let's look up phosphorus. Oh, fish. Okay, so it, it, it's a lot more interest, interesting. It's a three under a version, right? Yeah. Well, Fides is a, well, a three under a version. Yes. <laughs> oh, what, don't you trust? <laughs> so, so, fish, aversion to fish. So, phosphorus can have a version of fish. Okay. Na also it, so. Right. So, both. Uh, both phosphorus and natrium can either like fish or hate fish. Uh, Asarum phosphorus hates fish. Syrups, S E I R. What's that? Syrium. That's the cancer. The cancer knows it. Okay. Okay. Um, and the other thing was, okay, so what's your worst grief? You know, tell me about your griefs. Have you had any bad ones? And then the husband's making all these motions behind her back. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't say. Uh, but I asked it, you know, I was going to ask it anyway. So I said, so, you know, and she, so she started tearing up. I had to give her the Kleenex, but she wasn't sobbing like an, like a, um, Ignatia. She wasn't like spasmodically. She was kind of, kind of gently tearing. And then she said, yeah, my brother died of cancer 19 years ago. And then she has like this smile as she's tearing. And she said, he just died too soon. And the husband said, oh, yeah. I've known it, I've known in the last 20 years, you know, not to bring up that subject because it's just, it's just like twisting the knife, you know, it's it just, so she, and I said, well, how did you deal with it? And you know, she kind of smiled and said, well, you know, just life went on, right? So she, she didn't, she, she cried mainly alone. Um, but I mean, she didn't punch things, you know, she didn't, you know, have angry words, you know, um, that was just how she dealt with it. So I thought that was kind of a silent grief. Can I ask you yes. if you were to think that, did you ask her if she flared up around the time her brother died? Would that have been a significant? Yes, that's a good question. Did she flare up? Did her eczema flare up when her brother died? Her whole life, her eczema has been kind of flared, so it's kind of hard to say. Um, I, I'm sure I asked her that, but I can't remember. Honestly, I can't remember what she said, but that's a great question. If she flared afterwards, you know, then that could be, you know, ailments from grief, ailments from silent grief. And course. there's a great rubric, in case people don't know about it. It's ailment, it's grief prolonged and unresolved. Ooh, that's it's a good one. Oh, can you look that up for a second? Oh, yeah. Grief, that's a great one. That's grief great prolonged and unresolved. Uh, quite successful with that oh. So if you look under mind, uh, what? Phosphoric acid, acid, acid says okay, Dr. Okay, that's also, yeah. Grief. Grief. Um, prolonged. If you look under prolonged grief, it's carcinosum, natrium, neuroticum, and phosphorus. Um, and then undermining the constitution. Then we have undermining the constitution, the elements from the grief. Yeah, not phosphorus, but phosphoric acid. Undermining the constitution for prolonged grief. If you look under ailments from oh, grief, undermining what does undermining the constitution mean? That means that you've got so many symptoms, you don't know what to repertorize. Uh, so let's back up though. But the three of them that were in the rubric, grief prolonged, it's it was carcinosum, phosphorus, carcinosum, natrium, carcinosum, and, and carcinosum, natrium. Yeah, those three. So natrium, carcinosum, and phosphorus are the three for prolonged grief. Great, because I never used that rubric. So thanks, Francine. <laughs> good, super good um, tip. But I think the way you're going to get the phosphoric acid is not because you recognize prolonged and unresolved grief. I mean, what no, does that mean craving. versus grief? What you're going to see is by the food cravings, and you're going to see the person is apathetic and flat. I mean, that would be how I'd get it. I, I wouldn't. Apathetic, flat, or phosphoric acid. I've never used it. I would just use the grief. Mentally wiped out. Sure, okay. You have another. Burned out. Burned out. That use a lot of drugs or alcohol. They don't care about anything anymore. 
Ah, uh, so out. total apathy, burned out from drugs, says Dr. Shepard. Okay, but but um, what if you were gonna? Cause that's phosphoric acid, but in in prolonged, a Greek prolonged, Francine gave us that excellent rubric. So let's say that's not phosphoric acid; it's phosphorus carcinosin in natrium. So what would you expect for a phosphorus in this case versus a mirror? How would we differentiate the two? The sun. Yeah, the sun. So, so, cold drinks. so good question. So phosphorus would love cold drinks more. Wanting company. Wanting company. Gotcha. So, but phosphorus can look a lot like phosphoric acid. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but that is different. Uh, just what to, about the sex part of it? Uh, phosphorus, yeah. well, it's hard to say. Hypersexual phosphorus. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't show you a picture of her whole body. Um, she's, she's kind of slender, like about maybe five, six. And she thinks very quickly. She's basically, unless you talk about her group, she's a very upbeat, positive person. She certainly doesn't look burned out in any way. Um, so, so she's not a phosphoric acid for sure. Does she like constellation? Or, or social? Uh, she does not love and desire constellation, but she doesn't hate it. She says, it, you know, it's nice to know that people are thinking of me. It doesn't help, but it, it's kind of like she's, she's like, well, she's kind of ambivalent to it. She's like, thank you for your, you know, thanks for showing your support. It doesn't help her. Not like a, a pulse of toe where it's like, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you so much. It's kind of like in between, but she doesn't hate it. a real strong physical pathology. So, has anybody seen the movie Christopher Robin? <laughs> I didn't get to see it, but my wife and daughter did. And so um, I was like, so what should we do? And so, oh, that's just like Winnie the Pooh, my wife said, after he always, when he always had a very difficult life decision, he would just go to himself and he would say, what to do, what to do, what to do. <laughs> so what should we do with this case? <laughs> so those are, I mean, so you're thinking maybe carcinosin, maybe phosphorus, uh, maybe Nate, and maybe maybe a few others. What should we do? Hi, Bob. Hi, Mishi. What would you do? I, I'm doing okay. Not too good, but I can go on and on. Uh, thanks for asking. I just have a quick question from one of the attendees. Oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Manabi yes. is asking, what about her symptoms flaring on the anniversary of the death? Uh, Dr. Wanabi's question was, what? I didn't hear that. The symptoms flaring on. Yeah, the... what about her symptoms? Flaring? Oh, did her symptoms flare on the anniversary of her death? Of the death. Uh, yeah. Every year. On so the every year. You know, that's a great question. Uh, I didn't ask that. I've got a bunch of questions. So what if I said, oh, yes, every single day to the week, she flares up on the anniversary. So um, so that's really good. Um, what what rubric would that indicate? Like, uh, is there like a, like a. Uh, aggravates thinking about it. Aggravates. Possibly. Is there a good rubric? But is there one that like, like a time, like once a year on the, yeah. Um, is there a good rubric for that? Yeah. There is periodicity and generality. Ah, so a year. So if you had you like, for that, it has to be more yeah. of a memory. That's when the memory comes. And okay. So that's when I'm more. I would think thinking about it aggravates. Anyway, um, the uh, the the simple answer to that was no. I didn't ask that. I think I only had like about a half hour for this visit, so I didn't ask that. But um, but but Dr. Washanabi, quick question. So let's say let's say the husband said, oh yeah, every year that same day in October her eczema flares or her headaches flare or something flares. How would that help us? Would there be a remedy that that would have you um, think of? Um, cause, uh, Again, because it's an anniversary and on the anniversary you think about the person and then the grief comes back. So it's an right. from grief. Yeah, from if grief. every January on my headaches get worse and there's no other factors, then you can use annual application. Uh, okay. Because there's no other explanation. If there's an explanation, then you, have to. you can use it. Uh, okay. So Dr. Fuhrer had a good point. He said, and also Dr. Shepard, in general, there's something under periodicity and uh, annual every year, annual periodicity, annual. Um, uh, they said that that's a good rubric to use if every January you have a headache. It has nothing to do with grief or an accident or, or, or anything traumatic. Uh, then that would be appropriate to use it. In their opinion, um, if somebody has an annual or a biannual or whatever aggravation and it actually has to do with with um, uh, grief uh, or some other thing, uh, you know, car accident or whatever, um, then they said you shouldn't use annual, uh, you should use the uh, ailments from grief or ailments from suppressed grief or whatever. Um, but 
that's that was the opinion of two people here. I would be interested in hearing what the people in the webinar think. Would they use the um, the annual periodicity if it had to do with something deeper like a silent group? But let's move along. So okay, so who vote? Oh, uh, just, a, just a quick thing. Um, Tiffany had asked about having more anxiety with phosphorus, and I did oh. answer her and say yes, because you did say she was anxious. So good point. Um, so phosphorus is very anxious as well. Yes. You know, you can ask them specific fears, like thunderstorms and things like that. Um, but yes, I did answer that. There's a lot of remedies that are anxious, yes, and, and she was. And somebody, uh, Tama, mentioned also the pregnancy experience of her mother. It's good to know, but that's so long ago. I don't yeah. think it would be relevant to help solve it. Or what her what her mother craved. She might not know if she's seventy five, but you never know. It could still help you, you know, if she craved oh, fish and salt old, or whatever. Yeah, and then she also Tama also said that uh, Matt Mir has a fifteen the hour fifteen H aggregation. Yeah, so time. yeah, so so even so not only sepia, but um, so Tama says that even uh, at, at hour fifteen, so three p.m. even um, Nature has that too. So yeah, so that's good. So so it's another. Another indication for uh, Nate, and then the anxiety could be another indication for phosphorus. So usually, with phosphorus, the apathy and indifference that grief. Oh, but do phosphorus have apathy and indifference to grief? Strong. Oh, they do. Okay. As the Nat Mir is silent grief. Oh. Uh, also, in Nat Mir, you can ask them, do they want to cry alone? Yes. If they have a choice. She loves to cry alone. And there's consolation if they do cry in front of someone. Does it, if they do cry, does it make them feel better? And if the answer is no, then that's not me as well. She did not feel better with consolation. Now, if she were a phosphorus, she would love consolation, kind of like a pulsatilla, yes? She wouldn't care if she was in the apathetic stage. There's the different okay. stages. Okay, so she could be apathetic and she might not care for it, or it might make a big difference. So they, so would you say phosphorus could either be better with uh, consolation or Apathetic and, and kind of indifferent. Okay. okay. Indifferent. Those are all great. So, who votes for Ignatia? Who votes for carcinosin? Who votes for phosphorus? One, two. Who votes for phosphoric acid? Uh, who votes for uh, Machen urine? Tana does. So, Four natrium uh, so oh, oh so three phosphorus. Uh, it looked like I think it was four for uh, natrium mirror sepia. Okay, so the webinar people are saying nat mirror. We're saying phosphorus versus nat mirror with a slight emphasis on nat mirror. Okay. Phosphorus Tom has. Phosphorus uh, Tom says, all good thoughts. Or who says something else? So I can't tell you what the right remedy is, but um, I can tell you what I gave her. <laughs> uh, and I gave her Nature Muir. And this is pretty amazing if you understand that she's had it for like 74 and a half years. And this is just four weeks after starting Nate Muir. Uh, she was just taking, um, I think, just one dose. And then since she didn't flare uh, two days later, then she started taking. I think it was one dose a day. Um, it doesn't really show you, it doesn't, the photo doesn't really show you justice basically. Um, if you, but in person, um, the most important thing is, so if you palpate her, on the left here, she felt really thick like leather, about ready to crack if she made a fist uh, and ready to bleed. Um, a lot of open erosions. Um, really inflamed here it's about two or three shades of red less so less inflamed and now you're feeling it it's if like a zero is like a baby skin if a 10 is like where she's at here here she's like at about maybe like a five or a six which is pretty amazing now she still has a few erosions uh but still she is getting better and then this was um same thing four weeks later this was before um and then about the same thing maybe 40 50 percent better less um much softer. The only other thing that was changed, I didn't prescribe it, but um, I guess she was at her uh, family uh, practitioner's office, and they gave her uh, Atarax, which is hydroxyzine, which is an antihistamine. And um, 
Uh, and she said that that did help her sleep a little better at night because it got uh, the itching a little better. Uh, but other than that, nothing else changed except for the Nate urine. Ruby had a question. Yes. She raised her hand. Ruby, can you really get on? Ruby, you can you unmute her. her. I unmuted her. Hi, Ruby. Question? Ruby, unmute, unmute yourself. Maybe you're muted yourself. On, on our side, you're unmuted. Okay. Mute Ruby connected to audio. So she's connected. While she's being unmuted, let's can just also say that um, it's important to know that she's still been off of topical steroids. So she was off steroids for eight weeks when I saw her, and then now she's been off of it for you know a while longer, and no antibiotics. If she said I don't want to do homeopathic and I want to go conventional, I would have put her on a, a very low dose of desinide ointment, steroid, and I would have probably given her an antibiotic just so you know this would help heal a little faster. But thanks, I didn't have to do any of that. How was the itching? Oh, the itching is about maybe 40% better, 50% better. So it's not 100% better, but I mean, you get like 75 years of pathology. Is so, she continuing to improve? Is it is it something that's changing gradually over time? Well, this is the last time I saw her. This was like about two weeks ago. But um, is she continuing to improve with an eight year? Is that the question? Yes, she is. Yes, so it's still, now the funny thing was, so, I, so of course you can't just say, well, how's your skin doing? So, you know, how's your bowel movements? How's your sleeping? How's all that kind of stuff? And then when I got to, okay, so now tell me what you feel about your brother's uh, untimely death 19 years ago. And the husband's like, no, no, don't go there. No, no don't do it. Uh, but I was like, I got to ask her. And she didn't smile, but she didn't cry either. And she said, well, it is what it is, you know. So that tells me that I think that it's helping heal her grief, even from so many years ago. Okay, Tama has made some comments and has another question. Um, we, we do know, you know, that the baby can have the state of mind of the mother at the time of pregnancy. Right. And sometimes it does help, right? You bet. To, to know what the state of mind of the mom was at the time of pregnancy and the traumas and the griefs and those things. So we do know that. Absolutely. Uh, but I don't know in this ca case if uh, <laughs> he was able to get that. And uh, Tama also wants to know, did she dose him more? How did she dose? No, this was just, a, as Dr. Shepard and Dr. Fiora would say, this is just a dry dose. So just two pellets under the tongue. Once a day. Uh, yeah, well, we actually just did one to test the water. Thankfully, she did most of her flaring like months ago when her uh, chiropractic physician had her stop it. Otherwise, I bet she probably would have. So he probably did us a favor by, you know, letting her <laughs> get some of her soric flare out of the way, perhaps. Although the funny thing is, um, I don't know, you know, I don't, everybody talks about flaring and soric disease. Um, you know, I really don't see much flaring. Uh, sometimes they flare maybe a little bit for about a week or so, and they usually don't. But usually I tell people, I say, okay, you're new to homeopathy, so let me tell you, this is how it is, and we tell them about the pathology and everything. And then I say, there's not too many headache, or there's not too many um, side effects from the ear or whatever I give them, but usually I say about the, the main two side effects I would see with your Remy, I'm gonna give you for the first time now, is with higher potencies, not 30C, but if higher potencies like 200, if it's really working good, but you're starting to get headaches, that means you're just taking them too soon and you should spread them apart. So if you're taking one nature a week and you start getting headaches, but everything else is getting better, then I say, just take it and wait two or three weeks. And then, you know, and then maybe try another dose because maybe you're taking it too soon. But um, but I usually I, I usually tell them, but at nature 30C, I almost never see headaches. So don't worry about that, but I just want you to be aware of it. And the second thing is with any remedy, I say, especially with skin disease, especially with eczema, um, you can definitely flare up afterwards, but I almost never see it. And I don't think you're going to get it. And they oh, almost. Topical steroids, they get something as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, with, with getting off of topical steroids, yeah. that's a different story. Yes, of any course. Remedy. So. Okay, I have another question from Tom. What did you start her with daily or how frequently? So oh, yes. The so the postology question for Tama. Uh, so like I said, um, I think we gave her two dry pellets under the tongue and we just waited and saw what happened. And after about two days, she wasn't flaring anymore. Um, so then I said, okay, well, let's just start it um, two pills once a day. And if it starts flaring or something, just stop everything until it flare stops and give me a call. But she, she was fine. Did she have a second dose? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, at day two, she started taking two pills every day. On her own? Yeah. 
That's what I told her to do, unless it flares. What was the potency? What do you think about giving the exopotencies on a daily basis of the same remedy that you would give the whole Because I know I, I that some people would, let's say, give a remedy at 200 C phosphorus once sure. a month or every few weeks, but then have that person taking like a six X daily. What do you think about that? The question is, um, what about giving her an X potency instead of a C? I have almost zero experience with X potencies, mainly because my patients can't find them at Whole Foods or any of the stores. So, um, and I don't, I don't have them in my office, so I don't know. Although um, once personally, I used an X instead of a 30C and it worked just as good. I had I wouldn't have known the difference, but that I don't have any experience with it. So some moving- doctors do that almost like placebo. Oh. And then I know some doctors, we have a local doctor here who gives a remedy and high potency, like a 200, and then gives a lower potency daily, like an AX, which you can't get. So I think it's placebo. Oh. I, the Bill Fitz originally started doing that. Yeah, that person has a single dose prescriber for like a couple months. People didn't tolerate it, so we started using very low potency as a placebo. So um, the, the comment um, from our group here was that um, there are certain well-known homeopathic practitioners that may give like like a high potency, like a 200 C, maybe once every visit, every six weeks or whatever. And then they'll tell the person, well, why don't you take like a 6X or a 6C every day um, but the comment here was it, it's kind of almost more like a placebo uh, rather than really getting any benefit out of it. But um, I want to move along here because we're kind of running short on time. But um, there was a really courageous dermatologist. I got to take my hat off for him. Um, his name was Marvin Rappaport. He still is alive and he still practices. You can see him if you want to. He's in Beverly Hills, California. And um, he's a, a patch testing specialist and he... Um, he does a lot of eczema, and, and, and this was in 1999. At that point, I, uh, I had never heard about it before, but he had seen 100 cases of people with basically atopic eczema, um, and they, they just started out with just an eczema uh, on their eyelids, and then eventually, after using more steroids and higher steroids and strong steroids and getting off of them and they clear, they go back on, and then it would get to a, a whole red face instead of just a little eyelid dermatitis to be like the whole face. And it could even go like, like this patient, like on the body. So he courageously um, published it in the Blue Journal, uh, Journal of the Academy of Dermatology in 1999. And, um, and when I read that, I was like, because I was already in practice for what, like seven years. I was like, wow, that really makes sense. Um, I've only seen about maybe three people with not just like a localized, the facial thing you see more, but the localized, like I just showed you, I think I've only seen about two or three of them. This is like the most recent one that I saw. But um, but I mean, it has to be fairly, it can't be that uncommon because he actually had 100 cases, but he's kind of a specialized patch tester. So he might see more of those kind of people. But anyway, so the point is I was very courageous because, you know, as dermatologists, we use topical steroids every day. And um, so he he published his article. And then, um, and then like a few years later, Dr. Rappaport with another very well-respected dermatologist, Dr. Mark Lebwell, they published another one in Clinics of Dermatology, and they actually called it, um, I'll use this pointer so people can see me. Uh, they called it corticosteroid, basically a topical steroid addiction, and the withdrawal where they flare in the atopic patient. And um, this was um, this was kind of a kind of a good thing because you know that wasn't something most of us dermatologists were thinking of. So it really got us thinking like, hey. Maybe it's a good idea to give them breaks from the topical steroids. Maybe it's a good idea not to overdo it and to tell people don't keep getting this refilled by your private or by your primary um, um, practitioner because you know we want you to use it for maybe a month and get off of it. But you know, so so sometimes I'll tell my patients, so look, you know, if I don't have to see you again for a while, but you're seeing your primary um, practitioner, um, you know, if they want to keep giving you like 10 refills every year on it. Don't take them up on it. I want you to be off of it. I want you to use this just short term intermittently. It's important for practitioners to know that because otherwise they can get this, this syndrome. Um, but the funny thing is, um, I have a I have the, the rap report leave wall paper right here. If you look at the um, the tenth reference, there's a really famous dermatologist by the name of Al Kligman. He had published something in 1979. I just say 79, I think so 79. So 20 years before Dr. Rappaport astutely um, published this 20 years ago, Dr. Kligman, or the, you could pass on anything I um, Al Kligman actually um, published something like that. 
but you know, um, there's an, a non-physician by the name of Edward de Bono. He has this book and he talks about how new ideas happen in the world and, and Jung's collective unconscious and all those cool things. And anyway, he says, you know, if you have a really great idea, you know, and if you think the world is gonna really think you're great, you know, you've got another thing coming. If you have a good idea, you can't just have a good idea. You have to keep tooting your horn and tell them, you know, kind of like it's homeopathy. It's like it's been around for over 200 years. But we got to keep tooting our horns and showing people that it works because, you know, you got to keep telling the world something's a good idea until they finally come around. It takes people a long time to embrace new ideas, sometimes centuries. So, okay, so Kligman published it in 1979 and everybody kind of either never read it uh, or forgot about it. And then Dr. Rappaport and Liebel published it 20 years later, and now people kind of didn't really embrace it, and the people that did are kind of forgetting about it. Um, so it's kind of nice to kind of every so often kind of tell people about it because um, this is something good to know. Do any other dermatologists have that? Bob, I learned from you about this in Rappaport. I mean, is any other dermatologist that only talk about it? The only way I heard about it was this really cool article in the Blue Journal, which is a really good journal where everybody reads it. If it wasn't for me reading that, I still wouldn't know about it. I've never heard anybody talk about it in any of the annual meetings. It's kind of like the white elephant in the room that nobody really sees or nobody really comments on. In his white paper, he's a little more positive for the dermatologic profession. He, according to him, you know, eczema is really kind of a supplementing illness. And right. With top of the steroid addiction, it becomes this horrible, very difficult to treat illness. Even right. Similar to what Kahneman talks about in the organon. Probably have the quotes in the paragraphs. <laughs> it's interesting. Patients with different diseases, maybe sometimes easy, sometimes hard, not so hard to treat. But the more that they've been treated with allopathic medicine, the more difficult. And that's something we've seen practice all the time. Yes. So I, I think that Dr. Rappaport was a really courageous guy. Oh, by the way, uh, kind of as a coincidence, yesterday's Google Doodle had to do with Igne Semmelweis, the courageous Hungarian obstetrician who told everybody, you know, you gotta be like the nurse midwife. You better start washing your hands when you're doing pelvic examinations after you do postmortems on dead people that had sepsis, you know? And, and of course, you know, what happened to him? They, they rode him out of town from Vienna on a rail and they just, just barred him from his Viennese medical society. And then he went back to uh, hung, Hungary. And then what he, he forced the doctors he worked with over there to wash their hands. And their sepsis rate went way down to almost zero, the death rate. So, you know, when you're when you're telling people what we're doing right, but also what we're doing wrong, you have a good idea, you know, don't expect to really get the big prize, you know. But the cool thing is, um, uh, Dr. Rappaport has just quietly just kept telling people. And actually, like Dr. Um, Georgia said, um, he has his own website in case you want to read it. And he's even a little more specific and emotional on that one. And it's called red uh, skin syndrome um, dot com as you can see there and he even has youtube videos um but but the point is so what is it so he says okay in his experience most people start out with being an atopic eczema patient so we would call them soric patients you know the type they have asthma they have allergic uh you know uh, eczema allergic rhinitis um and then a lot of those people do have underlying um eyelid dermatitis, so he would see them a lot in his past testing clinic. And of course, most of them are on topical steroids because for many years that was all pretty much we could do. Um, but this is this is um, a really important thing. This is a real good reason to introduce homeopathic medicine um, because, um, I mean, everybody knows that Dr. Rappaport's only main treatment of steroid addiction is get them off of it, detox them, get them off, and the only so, so the good thing is that they get better. The bad thing is, if you think they're going to love you, the patients are probably not. They may hate you because. And if you look at his paper, um, it can go up to thirty-six months, so three years of terrible, hellacious flaring before it stops. Now um, that was just in his sample of hundred people. I mean, uh, but there could be people that even flare longer than that. In fact, if um, so, the good thing is if you do that. 87 percent of the people can be completely cured of this addiction uh, but only after complete cessation sometimes years later but so if you're a pessimist you'd say well what happened to those 13 percent i mean you know what about them well those are the ones that either jump ship and, and hated you the doctor that, that took them off of what they loved and then so they just go to somebody else and get more topical steroids 
or um, you know maybe they, um, they they stop it for a while, uh, but they they never stop flaring. So they just you know, or, or who knows? Maybe they just have the eggs and they die later. Okay. That's not talked about in the These patients are difficult to manage. You bet. They'll call on you every day. Every you other bet. Day, twice a week, three times. Right. Yeah. So down. These are the patients. Very hard to manage. And you have to understand this. Otherwise, right. what am I doing wrong? You're not doing anything wrong. Right. This is a vicious. Treating eczema, easy. Treating eczema when they're in step up the stairs with crawl. So Dr. Fiore's Dr. Fiore's point is well taken. Not only is it hard for a conventional dermatologist to manage this, but it's hard for you as the homeopath because um, you know you get frequent phone calls and they're flaring and it's it's difficult. But as we've shown, at least in this case, if you can find the right remedy and if they can stick with it, I really think we should publish a a case study. So like you know, and this I want you to know this isn't something you see every day. I mean, you know, I've only seen three really bad cases of steroid addiction widespread like this in like, you know, 27 years. So don't think that every single person on steroids gets it. But I'm sure it's common enough for all of us to at least have one or two cases. But I've seen lots of cases. <clears throat> well, I mean, I've seen lots of cases. Uh, on steroids and has trouble withdrawing from it. So I mean, if it's as common as what homeopaths are seeing, why hasn't anybody in the homeopathic world done a paper on this? And said, you know, steroid addiction and homeopath homeopathic medicine can help because in this article they say the only real real treatment is getting off of it and frequent phone calls, frequent empathetic visits, hand holding, maybe a little antihistamine at nighttime, maybe a little ultraviolet B therapy. But basically, they're saying there's nothing you can do except you know, uh, cold turkey. We know that the homeopathic medicines work, but has okay. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody here seen an article which shows people that had steroid addiction topically and because of the steroid they had before and after picture showing that they really did well? Yeah. Yeah. It'll have to be you, Bob. No, it can't be me. It can't be me because I might wait another 10 years to see another patient like this. It has to be, no, it has to be us. So everybody, so what I would say is if you're a member of the AIH, if you're a member of the NCH, if you're a member of the Illinois Homeopathic here, we should all start taking before pictures uh, when you see somebody like this, and then it's our job to take good quality after clinical pictures. So if I have one case with a good picture, which we have here, and Joel has one, and Dr. Pierre has one, and Francine has one, and Lisa, you know, and Ashley has one, we all have one. Nobody's going to listen to one anecdote if you're a conventional doctor. But if you have high quality before and after pictures, and we can come up with 50 or 100 cases, just like Dr. Rappaport came up with 100 cases, and if we could publish it, then people might say, oh, I guess. There is a treatment for it. You could try home yeah, But we have that problem with every drug, antihistamine resistance or withdrawal, antibiotic withdrawal, antihypertensive withdrawal. But we're, we're not we're not dermatologists. We see the whole spectrum. Sure so we see a patient. There. The problems are number one, thank you for teaching teaching us about this. I mean, you taught me about this, and I've become acutely aware of it, and I explain it to patients. If you don't explain this to patients, they will never follow oh, through. With oh, oh excellent point. Yes. So number one is I think there's nothing written because no one knows about it. So thank you so much for educating us. And number two, it is difficult dealing with these patients. It, they're patients from from that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's it's and why aren't there more articles published? Why aren't there more articles published about cancer? Yeah. Because it's difficult to treat those patients yeah. with advanced stage. It's kind of like that. Treating a patient like this, you really have to talk to them. You really have you might have to try it it's right. like your case turned out really well let me tell you my experience rare to see it that well mostly it's a rocky ride it's a, it's a roller coaster and then the patient patients that come to us on on our other drugs for other problems right. they're probably contributing they have family issues they have other issues I mean, right. it's, it's, so so tim's point is well taken number one <laughs> it basically it that's why I put the unhappy face here. Um, but but Tim's point is not only are these the, the cases from hell that are really hard, but he said, don't forget, tell the patient, look, you know, this is what's going on. And no matter who you go to, when you stop it, you are gonna flare. You gotta know that. It's gonna be ugly and it's not gonna be overnight. This isn't a slam dunk. And you have to tell them about it because if you don't, not only will they be angry that they're flaring, they'll be angry at you. And, and, they and give you really online. bad Yelp reviews, so you gotta tell them. They look it up online, and then they see, oh, other people 
have this in the palm, but you have to give it a word. If you don't give right. it a name, right. like if you look at pot, pot, uh, topical steroids to your bronze, right. they can look it up and they can say, oh, other people have the same thing. Otherwise, they'd be like, why am I being tortured? Right, exactly. Now, the other thing is, Tim said, no matter what, even if you're an excellent homeopath that has numerous years of experience, sometimes you still can't find the remedy, or sometimes it might take weeks and weeks and weeks to find the right remedy. And so I have to tell you, I have to confess that with this case, if she didn't have something really to, big to hang her hat on, she had such such terrible silent grief. And I was like, she's gotta be a nightmare, and if it isn't, then maybe phosphorus or whatever. I knew I was gonna, if I treated the grief, like Dr. Minky Lin always used to say, you know, treat the underlying, you know, what, what's really bothering her. What's the, aside from the flaring of her skin, it was that terrible underlying grief. Now, if she just came in and said, I have a grief, <laughs> my, hum, my husband is great, I don't have any griefs, everything's just fine, you know, I'd be like, well, okay, I'll try and find your sonolimum, I'll try and find your chronic remedy, but, but I, I bet you I wouldn't have had any success. We get like topic from the patients of one year old and you know, try and find their remedy of the real problem. Right, right. <laughs> and they've been on steroids for nine months. Dr. Shepard's point. Silent grief yet. <laughs> right, right. And this Maybe patient parents. had 75 years so she could tell us what her personality was like. Dr. Shepard lamented that with one year old infants, they can't tell you how they react, you know, et cetera. And it's even harder. Yeah. Or our veterinary colleagues, look at our veterinary colleagues, you know, we have, they can't listen. You know, to the dog talking to them. And it's it's even more complicated. I have the one case that's a common who the yeah. kid is really flared and he's really doing much, much better. I say he's 80 percent better, yeah. but he's still flares. And I'm trying to figure out why is it so bad? I mean, we've been getting to see for years now. The mom got uh, steroids during pregnancy, and she had to talk to guys and was uh, using steroids while he while in in utero, uh, and then he got topical steroids. For, I guess. He, you know, delivery, you got steroids. Oh, they so gave it steroids even before. Oh. And I was like, ah, okay, that's the that's the smoking gun. That's why this case is yeah. so there's so many factors. There's another thing I just want to make a comment to possibly consider. Um Kimalia had a, a whole health now presentation on the glyphosates. Uh-huh. And the glyphosates, the, the, the chemicals. It specifically people eating so much wheat mm. and you had actually had a case that responded without even rem remedy to some kind of skin problem that right. nurse uh just getting off of wheat right. that you presented to us so maybe that should be part of the picture getting these people off of wheat or non-organic yeah. uh food as much as fun. possible and what about uh you know because the liver has to detox all this what about using something like milk thistle to help with just in detox in general, yeah. Because the people that are on steroids a lot end up having to have their livers monitored. Right. So maybe something that supports liver detox. Sure. Just, just some other thoughts. Sure. Good points. Okay. So the take-home point is, even though this is a hard thing to do, <clears throat> the most I'm important sorry, I'm thing is that classical homeopathic medicine can be a helpful treatment for the steroid addiction withdrawal syndrome. In addition to, of course, getting them off of the steroids in the first place. And this is something that we can we can help our conventional colleagues. We can help them with this. Yes, Amishi. Amishi Sorry, had a question. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a comment from Dr. Pralo uh, okay. referring to the aggravations. Um, of, uh, you know, she's asking to consider aphorism 161 from the sixth yes. edition, which talks about the uh, aggravation in chronic cases, which uh, Hanneman suggested happens. Uh, towards the the stage where the disease is almost about to get cured. Oh, that's a good point. What do you guys okay, think? So the disease that. is from the medicine because the medicine is similar to the disease. If the disease is less and less and less, then you get the med medicinal disease even from a homeopathic remedy. But that's only in patients who improve at the end of the disease. Right? And then the treatment is to get rid of the medicine. It only has to then you have to stop the medicine for seven to 14 days and decide whether it was the medicine or they need a different strength of the remedy or retake the case. So, so when Hahnemann says that sometimes when people aggravate severely, it could be right on the cusp of a cure. But what about a case like this, who's flaring even before you even started a remedy? I don't think Hahnemann was referring to that, was That's he? It's a different paragraph from the wrong potency of the, the remedy 
then you either, if there are new symptoms, you have to retake the case and give a different remedy. If it's an aggravation from too strong of a remedy, you might have to antidote. Although in my practice, of the, the right remedy is the best antidote. Or you just uh, give them something palliative, like milk thistle or whatever, emollients, until the aggravation wears off if it's uh, tolerable to the patient and safe, according to the doctor. Hmm. We have a question about what? Dale John. I'm going to try to unmute him so he can ask connected to. You're connected to audio now, Dale. If you have a question, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Hey, Dale, how are you? Oh, hey, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, something that I've learned in, uh, with regard to presenting data and data points to patients who have been on um, long-term steroids and they present with fatigue and they present with uh, intermittent weight loss and gastrointestinal disorders. Um, is uh, when running uh, labs, we can always, oftentimes I can point to uh, electrolyte imbalance, which is one thing. Um, and then um, if I can get their FP to run an ACTH stem test, sometimes that provides us with plenty of data points to point to. Um, hypoglycemia is very uh, common uh, from a functional perspective with uh, uh, steroid, um, I guess you'd say addiction. And um, so when we get the results back, we often have, um, then we have data points to, to say, okay, we're going to start here and then we're going to move forward, whether it be uh, a homeopathic remedy or uh, oftentimes we have to start in the gastrointestinal tract as well. Um, but then as they progress, we will see these lab values shift as well. So uh, don't forget, those of you who run labs or functional labs, don't forget to evaluate um, for cortisol and uh, electrolyte imbalances. Um, and if you, if you can't do an ACTH, just, just stay focused on, um, you know, sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, very important. Um, because and even aldosterone. So, uh, and these are these are these I've I've been I've been able to show patients uh, their serial lab results, um, no matter what approach we take from a therapeutic standpoint. Um, yeah. So, for example, uh, hyponatremia, uh, hyponatremia is common. Uh, hypochlorhydria. Um, low levels of CO2. And then in contrast to that, we might see a hyperkalemia uh, as well. So again, uh, and also functional uh, hypoglycemia where we're looking at insulin, glucose, and their uh, A1Cs as well. Those change as well. So for people who love data and have to have information and you can present it to them in black and white, these are some basic some basic metabolic tests or see if you wish to add. Some good functional medicine points. Okay, let's move along. So this is a second case from my practice. And this is a cute little guy, he's nine months old. He's actually had eczema as you can see since, since if I point you here for the people at home. Okay, um, he's had it since about one month. So he's had it for eight months so far. And, um, his clinic that was treating him at home had him on a, a fairly strong mid-potency fluorinated steroid ointment. And um, you can't really see it, but um, he's, he's lost most of his hair uh, because as, as soon as he gets in the office, he's rubbing and scratching his head. There are some eczema patients when you see them and they're really thickened and the skin is so thick like the one I just showed you before. There are other patients like this where if you're looking for thickness, you're not gonna see it. You might actually look at him and say, well, heck, he didn't really have that bad of an eczema after all. But if you if you really palpate the skin, like right over here, yeah, uh, if you go, if you palpate right here, it really feels thick, kind of like sandpaper and kind of like here over there too. Uh, so actually, he, his, his eczema is actually worse than what it looks in the photo here. 
He's got a lot of eczema here. The atopics get him in the body folds. You look mm -hmm. at, he's got lots of plaques, lots of redness here. And you can't, unfortunately, I kind of cut off the top here. I didn't get up to the photo, but his whole scalp is, is, is really, looks like he has a Q-tip because um, he's been just scratching off his, his hair. So he's losing his hair. That's what the parents are bringing him in for. Also the itching. And um, they would like to um, get him off of the steroids if possible. I mean, that's not something they came in for, but I said, so, you know, would you like to try a natural homeopathic medicine to see if we can get you off the steroids? And the father was definitely amenable to it. Uh, so once again, uh, I would have liked to have a two hour visit, but I didn't, I only had like about maybe a, a half hour visit, but um, so, you know, how's his sleeping while well, he's scratching at night, but then eventually he sleeps pretty well. Um, how's the bowel movement? He's constipated. He has a bowel movement over only every two days. And I said, well, what's it like? And he said, oh, he'll let you know. He lets out a yell every time he has a bowel movement. So he's got painful constipation. And I said, so anything else, you know, um, how about spitting up? No, you know, how about diarrhea? No, uh, how about gas? Oh yeah, he smells terrible. Um, so, so really bad. And um, so he wakes up happy, he, except when he's scratching. He's a happy kid. He, he, the father says, he's so happy. He even uh, smiles at strangers. So I said, so, you know, how is it when you undress him? You know, is, you know, look, look, look at the physical generals. You know, is he a hot, is he a warm kid? And um, he hates warm rooms. He, he really lets you know that he's uncomfortable in a warm room. And that's about all the time I had to ask him. So is Winnie the Pooh would say, what to do, what to do? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, the first choice is, I can't help you. I want you to come back. Let's do the two hour visit. Uh, they don't have the money for a two hour visit. They might not even come back a second time. This is the only chance I may have to, to help him with homeopathy or anything else. So I chose to, to, I had a fairly good feeling of what the remedies were. So I chose to treat him. But what would you do? Would you have him come back two weeks later and schedule a two hour? Or mm -hmm. would you try and treat him? Try and treat him. Okay. So mm -hmm. what are some of the keynotes here that would help us get a fairly accurate prescription? I thought the painful bowel movement, the GI symptoms, you know, lots of malodorous gas, um, you know, constipation. I thought that was pretty, pretty key. Uh, there really wasn't anything characteristic about his eczema. I mean, you know, most infants with eczema are like that. I mean, you know, his, his, the area that he had the eczema was pretty typical. You know, the scratching, that was pretty typical. So, so pretty much I prescribed mainly on non-dermatological findings. Um, uh, sweat. Uh, he was not a sweaty kid. He did not sweat at nighttime. So you would think of now carbs, that's like a nice slam dunk if they said, oh, you know, every night, you know, when, I, when he wakes up from sleep and he has a puddle on his pillow, then yes, you might think of cow car, especially if he was chilly with, okay. with cold, clammy sweat, which he didn't have. What if he lets out of the As soon as he passes it, it hurts so bad. He's like, ah, you know. So he could have had a fissure from the constipation, maybe, or just, just painful, painful bowel movements. So what kind of remedies are you thinking of as a homeopath? Sulfur, yes, the number one, the king of sorum, or um, the okay, sorum. Muscle. Muscle. That's a sulfur versus calc carb infants. So calc carb are more chubby, flabby, yeah. would you say? Yeah. And the sulfur kids are more muscular looking? Right, okay. Proportion. Okay, maybe. So so that, that means maybe you have a vote or two for sulfur. That's actually a good thought. Good. What about the uh, male odorous flash lens and GI problems? Sulfur, sulfurous. Could be sulfur. He didn't say it smelled like rot, rotten eggs, but it could be sulfur. So we're thinking sulfur. What about being a, a happy child? Sulfur? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not liking the heat. Not liking the heat. So when somebody says, I hate a warm room, or if their parents say so, I always think of sulfur, I always think of pulsatilla, um, I think of lycopodium, but even there's other ones that hate warm rooms like Nature Mira, um, many other remedies, you know, warm room aggravates, it's kind of a big rubric.
It's not good. So Dr. Shepard says, don't treat, have them come back after we get a whole two hour. And that that is probably the most academically academically correct answer. <laughs> but um but I knew he would never come back. I knew the parents couldn't afford a two hour visit. And I knew he would go back to his free clinic and he would get more of the fluorinated steroid. Okay. So I was between a rock and a hard place. So Dr. Shepard says, well, maybe try 6X. So that's good. So maybe he might not aggravate. So 6X sulfur. What what do you say, Lisa? Ashley? Let's and how about are you gonna do a single dose and wait? Or are you gonna just uh what are you gonna do? These are people who don't know anything about homeopathy. Uh so how are you gonna tell them how to post out? Postologize. Oh, oh. So call, take one dose and call us in a week, maybe. Okay. Three days. Call, three call days. me in three days after the six x sulfur. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. So. Well, there are acid. Room nitric acid, natrium, all have painful stool. Excellent tip from screaming Doctor. After screaming after stool. Nitric acid. What about like a podium? What about like a podium? Thank you. Uh, that's that was the first thing I thought it was like a podium. Tiffany, you rock. Yes, what made you think about like a podium, Tiffany? Okay, I'm gonna, Tiffany, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, so that you can tell us what you think. Give me a minute. I'm unmuting you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Tiffany. Oh, okay. Hi, um, I just immediately thought about the flatulence and the gastrointestinal components, and I thought about like a pedium. I, exactly, that, that's what I thought of too. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> that's all I have. Any other? So, with give us some pearls. What are some other really good keynotes that really have gotten you some success with like a podium patient, uh, Tiffany? What others? Oh, I'm a student. <laughs> that's okay. Hey, you have incredible insight. What other kind of pearls can you lay on us? Other pearls? Oh, and the clinical, clinical tips that will help us for with this baby. Yeah. Mm. Or like, let's say, let's say you asked all those questions I just did, Tiffany, and you're like, right. I think this kids are like a podium. What would you ask as a student to consider? Oh, oh, well, oh, now I understand the question. Oh, so. Um, maybe I would ask about how he responds to different types of uh, when the when the mom is feeding him in terms of if if she if she's giving him warm uh, drinks or something like that. Does he dislike cold foods if you're out in the car and you, and you got to give him cold baby food because he can't warm it up? Yeah, that's right. what I thought because like a podium love warm food, don't they? In fact, sometimes they eschew cold food. Yeah, excellent. All right, mm -hmm. well, let's see if Tiffany's right. Or let's see if Dr. Shepard's right, or any other thoughts? Let's see here. Four to eight PM. Oh, four to eight p.m. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if he has flaring of nasal ala, if he has frowning, if he if he gets worse and he loses his smile at four to eight, those are good confirmatories. So okay, let's see what to do. Well, this is what I did. I listened to Tiffany and I gave him like a podium. I'm not telling you. He got better, but I gave it to him. <laughs> so we crushed it because he's a little baby and we don't want him to choke on it. We stopped the triumphal ointment, hoping he's not addicted to it. Hopefully he's not going to flare. And we said, come back in four weeks. Okay, somebody here commented, Tama comments, I, I have students do 24 hour phone reports. 24 hour phone reports are a good idea. Good tip. So the mother brought him in this time and she's just so happy. She's like, oh, my baby's hair is growing back. And I'm um, because he his hair was like about maybe only 25% as thick as um, what it is up here. So so that's cool. You're looking at his eye plaques. His eye plaques are a little red, but they're much less thick and they're much better. Um, so I said, okay. I think he was taking like photo and see once a day. So I said, oh, let's get him on twice a day. And uh, but he was still having a flatulence and the um. He wasn't screaming as much with his poops, but he still had the flash on. So I said, well, you know, um, if the if the cow's milk is a cause of occasionally okay, analysis, is, is Hanuman would say maybe we could switch to soy. So I said, well, okay, let's try that. 
and he, and the, he was, they were able to get that uh, approved, so they got that. So we saw him back, and then and here he is, and he, I'll get to that in a second. Here he is in um, week 17. Uh, he's taking like a podium. Uh, he was all clear, except I didn't get to see him, but then he ran out of um, like a podium. So four weeks later, he flared, but so this is like, uh, like about, um, he's, he's been flaring for like maybe two weeks, um, but he was all clear. But even now, even though he flared, he's still significantly better than he was back then. How do you know? Well, one way is because in real life, in teledermatology, you can't really tell this, but in real life, you're gonna be palpating him. So I'm palpating here, it's not sandpaper anymore. It feels like a baby skin, literally. Um, I'm feeling here, look at these dark things. You might say on teledermatology, you would say, oh my goodness, He's developing lichen planus. Oh, you know, this is terrible. No, this is post-inflammatory pigmentation. When you clear up, that's what you expect. Um, the lighter our skin, the more pinkish it looks, the, uh, the more color we have, the, um, the darker it looks. So this, this is perfectly normal. I palpated it, it feels like perfect skin. That's, that's not a bad thing. The other thing, hang on. The other thing is um, he's sleeping through the night. He doesn't wake up. He has no further melod or flatulence. He doesn't yell at all with the bowel movement. His bowel movements are more regular. And now instead of every two days, it's like maybe every one to two days. And the cool thing is his scalp is all clear. His eyelids are all clear. And even his diaper area got better. Yes, Tana. Tana, are you there? Okay, we'll move on. Once she gets back to us, we'll answer your question. No, I don't. I, I do not have a question right now. No questions. OK, Tim. I think there's an alchemy in here. Yes. Totally cause Remove the pause. Remove the pause. Totally cause them, Dr. Fior says. So we remove the soy, but it still came back. In my mind, if it's like this, starting at one month, I mean, that's before the usual shots, but now they're giving me shots at birth. Mm -hmm. Moms are giving shots during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Mawson study, the rate of atopic disease, when you look at homeschool kids who are vaccinated or unvaccinated, it's 30 times higher. 30 times. You don't need statistics to see there's a difference. Mm -hmm. That's the elephant in the room. And if you don't address that, what's going to happen? Now, luckily, he's at an age that he doesn't have any vaccinated. But the next time he's vaccinated, he gets left. So, Tim's point is that another elephant in the room is he thinks that um, because all the kids are vaccinated pretty much at birth, that that could be one of the causes that's making him have his historic disease. And that, so what would you suggest? No further vaccines then, so he wouldn't flare? Well, you have to at least discuss it with parents. And, I mean, right now it's getting more and more difficult to discuss vaccines right. because all exemptions are being removed, medical right. and religious. Even in Illinois now, they're trying to remove most medical and all religious exemptions. So, so Tim so, says that it's a difficult conversation. And sometimes you can't have them stop the vaccines because of what your legalities are in your state, but at least you could have the conversation. Yes. Would you, if, if you knew that uh, uh, this, your patient was sensitive and material to vaccination, could you give, if you, like this, this little boy, if you cleared up with the like lipoprotein and you needed another vaccination, would you prophylactically give him the like lipoprotein? So you might give him a similar to strengthen his, him, perhaps, but yes? But you want them to wear that. I'll tell you, that in other cases, it's like really perfect skin. And the doctor gave a new shot, a hexamix or something. It has six different adjuvants, oh. six different uh, antigens. And to make it work, they had to add extra aluminum. Ooh. Within a week, he broke out in a rash all over his body. Perfect skin, now rash all over. And he had these little grayish little things coming out. Which to me, that was the aluminum adjuvant that came out. So if you get a shot and you give the remedy, it's going to break. The rash is going to get worse because the body's trying to. What's the body trying to do? It's trying to get rid of the aluminum adjuvant that it can't get rid of. Yeah. It's interesting. And when you look at people trying to discover what's really going on, what's really going on, they think it's the, one of the possible causes. If you look at uh, uh, Exley in, in, in England. Uh, he's finding people with autism have the highest rates of aluminum in the brain when mm -hmm. they do an autopsy when the person dies of, that they've ever discovered. And where does aluminum come from? Well, we're injecting all this aluminum in kids from the vaccine. We've taken out most of the mercury, and we're injecting all this aluminum. Yeah. 
you get inflammation, it gets in the macrophages, and then they get another shot. When the macrophages get activated, you go to the brain. But it can also it can come out through the skin. So something to, something to think about. So Tim had some very important points about possibly the aluminum adjuvant and being kind of a, 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 a cause of some of these cases. Even, even vitamin K has aluminum. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So, uh, my, my question before you get to the uh, next one. You left. Uh, okay, in, in this case. We'll this and then wait 20 minutes for the drink. You make the drink first. Okay. Yeah, it's not Someone has a question? Yes, yeah. Uh, Bill. Bill, yeah. Um, in a case like this, when we have a nine month baby that has been um, with all these problems, but the mother is breastfeeding this baby would you look to the mother too and you treat to the mother uh, you can treat the mother sometimes will some mothers prefer to take the remedy themselves i mean i'd be interested to know dr Shepard's experience and others experience but oftentimes the rem remedy when the mom's nursing the remedy the mom needs is similar to the remedy the baby needs so you can give the mo mother the remedy and the baby will react to it too but also certainly if the mom's nursing, what the mother's eating is affecting uh, the baby potentially as well. So if the mom, if the kid is sensitive to gluten and the mom's eating gluten or eating dairy or eating beans, if you have a lycopodium case, maybe it's, and the kid has issues, it could be related to that. So the mom's diet can affect the kid. Okay, thank and you. That's what I was thinking. Mom had can affect the kid too. What's that? Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I need time out and get this better. Give me just a minute to unmute her. Time out, I'm not muting you because you had a couple of questions here. Okay, thank you. Um, you, had, you mentioned in the, the antecubital space that you palpate for that hyperpigmentation. You said you palpated it. What are you uh, wanting to know? Oh, uh, what what Bob Bob is uh, taking a quick break here. Uh, he he was trying to differentiate. Uh, Someone was asking why. I think lichen planus. Oh she yeah. Was, she was, she was saying why did you palpate the, the hyperpigmentation? Oh, good point. Um, well, see, nowadays we're doing more and more teledermatology and stuff like that. And homeopaths yeah. have always done like phone consultations and Skype and stuff like that. But one of the hazards of treating skin diseases is that. <clears throat> Dermatology is three-dimensional. You got to get in there. You got to you got to palpate the tissue. Um, the, the main thing is, um, like in planus, you would have felt indurated little flat papules. You know, they would be have a certain hardness to them. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. That's when, like as a kid, you fall off your bike and you have a scab on your knee, right? And then when the scab comes off in a few weeks, what's the color look like? Is it nice, normal, flesh-colored? Uh, no. Most of the time, it's kind of pinkish or kind of purpley looking, depending on how much color we have. And um, that's called post-inflammatory pigmentation. Uh, and that's perfectly normal. So it's important for homeopaths to realize that um, just because you see something doesn't mean it's a bad thing. You would expect that. Um, that's why having, you know, having as much experience as you can with pathology and normal skin will help you differentiate. Um, um, like lichen planus is a rash which is much less common than psoriasis and eczema. And that's characterized by kind of purplish, violaceous, um, flat, kind of firm papules, where this is totally normal skin. So you just reassure the parent, it's just the type of um, skin pigmentation so we get after we've had inflammation or after we fall off our bike and get a little injury. So you can reassure them that he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. We gave him a little bit of over-the-counter um, uh, uh, over-the-counter um, uh, glycolic acid cream, and that makes the pigmentation go a little faster, but it's not necessary. Just with time, it will go away. Unfortunately, in Fitzpatrick fives and sixes, you know, uh, a Fitzpatrick one will be the lightest pigmented person. Fitzpatrick five or six is the other end of the spectrum. The, 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 the more color we have, the longer your post-inflammatory pigment will remain. So my wife's a Fitzpatrick one, if she gets like something like that, her little pink spots will be gone in like maybe two months because she's Irish and German and she's super light. 
On the other hand, um, Fitzpatrick fives and sixes, they may have to deal with this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Let me get the, um, oh, here it is. Um, Fitzpatrick fives and sixes, we give them glycolic acid cream because it's gonna look like wait for about four or five years before it goes away on its own. And if that's, not, if that's on your face, that could be quite a, a, a nuisance cosmetically you know, and, and socially. So um, a little glycolic acid cream looks great. Okay, okay. let's move on. I've got a, got a yeah. clarification on that, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things, when do you repertorize, for example, there are people that have after eruptions, like you see with acne or something, that they do they have uh, that bluish or purplish discolorations? Does that also have a susceptibility to post inflammatory okay. healing effect, or is that susceptibility of that person that would be scarred no. that they have? Well, no, for, for the. Would you repertorize? I wouldn't because that's the, everybody gets that post inflammatory pigmentation. It's not even worth recognizing. Yeah. It's not characteristic that's of that person. It's characteristic of us as humans, depending on the uh, ability to. Everyone um, with the so sun and sun gets it. Once the, so once the redness goes away, uh, some pigmentation. Yes, everybody gets it. You don't tell them you can keep that from the opposite in your discoloration from your eruptions. I haven't found post-inflammatory pigmentation to get any better with homeopathic remedies. How about you, Dr. Shepard, Dr. Pure, has anybody? A little housekeeping, we're getting a lot of uh, background noise, so if you could please mute yourself in the webinar, that would be helpful. <laughs> All right, last case. This is somebody that I showed you last November. So um, if you were here or if you're on the webinar last November, you may recall, this was a lady that had the psoriasis-like eruption on her legs and also uh, her feet and maybe a couple other areas. And I showed uh, this to you last um, November. Could you please mute yourself, check your... Your information we are getting. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we could just have everybody at home mute themselves um, because we're getting a lot of background um, noise. So who has had an eruption? Um, and her actually, her immunologist did two skin biopsies, which showed it wasn't strong, so it actually was um, um But the pathology report said that although it looks like it's a form of eczema. Sure, it's negative for fungus. That's what this PAS stain is. Um, uh, negative for fungus. But um, they said you could not rule out a drug reaction. So she could actually be getting a drug reaction. And it just so happened that when I asked her, she said, yes, this rash did come out after my doctor started me for the first time ever on a, um, a blood pressure medicine called nifedipine. So of course, in the, um, uh, the footnote of paragraph seven, in the Oregon on Hahnemann says, uh, the the good physician would always uh, not uh, would always uh, remove the cause of or would, would remove the, um, the the offending agent. So like if you had a drug reaction, yes, you could treat them with one of the remedies, but it would be nice to realize it's a drug reaction, get them off the drug. So that was something we also were looking into as well. We have a question. Um, I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, you're unmuted, Candy. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no, I don't. No, I oh, don't. Raise your hand. I thought. Okay. So, um, so anyway, this is what we showed you last November. This was before, and then this is four weeks after she took her chronic remedy. So you can see that she was getting better. So this is where we left off last November. Um, now, a little background for this patient. Um, she also said that aside from her rash, over the last few months when she first came in, she had been having this muffled sound in her left ear, kind of like she had an ear plug in her ear, like she had water behind her eardrum and she couldn't hear. And she said it feels like a crackling. Uh, and it just so happens that her crackling got better with her next mirror after a month, it was about 30% better. Why is this important? Well, that's important for anybody. Uh, but what happened to her when she was in high school, somebody smashed her on the head with a, um, a two by four and um, knocked her out 
and uh, she got mastoiditis and she's totally deaf, totally 100% deaf in her right ear. So when somebody only has one ear and they're starting to get problems with it, that's a real problem. So she was very happy that her, her chronic remedy is helping that as well. Only 30% better, but that's, that's a good thing. Especially because her conventional ear doctors haven't really been having too much success with her. She has nasal pop, she has like a lot of sinus issues and uh, she wasn't getting any better. So this was a good thing. So this is the update here. So then this is week 19. Now, if you notice, she was on Nature Muir, but in the interim time, um, what happened was she said, Doc, something funny is happening. You know, um, I'm nice when I go into bed, I'm nice and you know cozy and everything, but about halfway through, I'm getting so hot, you know, I'm getting, so I say, what do you do? And she said, well, I kick one of my feet out. It doesn't matter which one it is, but I just put one out and somehow that like gets all the heat out of my body and I can sleep for the rest of the night. So I'm like, what remedy do you think I was thinking of then? So Lisa says sulfur. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of too. So I said, well, okay, let's try it. So I switched her to sulfur and, uh, and then now she's, her shins are even better. So instead of 40% better, I'd say they're, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 70, 80% better. Uh, what I didn't show you down here, both of her feet still have some, it's a little bit redder than this. And she has a little bit behind like her ankles and the lower part of her legs. So she's doing better, but she's still not like 100% better, but I'm happy, she's happy. Now she's really happy because the left ear crackling sensation is about 50% better. So it went from 30% less to now it's 50% better. And she has no further muscle ear, so she can actually hear perfectly now, even though it's cracking. So I'm happy about that. Um, somewhere along the line in those 19 weeks, she said that um, I've got another funny symptom. I wake up at three in the morning and I worry about the next day's business and I just can't go back to sleep. And um, I didn't really think that the remedy she was on was covering it. So I did give her an intercurrent uh, dose, or actually it was several doses over a couple of weeks. Um, of Nuxlamica 30C. And I said, so how'd that make you feel? And she said, oh, I don't even have to take the Nux anymore. My sleep is fine. I don't wake up at three in the morning. That's a good point. Okay. It's interesting. Uh, Francine is showing me the rubric for uh, uh, waking midnight after three. It says Nux, Vomica, and Sulfur. Uh, it's interesting. That oh, the two highest grades. Uh, the two highest grades. Yeah, there's like a bunch of remedies, seven remedies. It's interesting that um, Nux and Sulfur are the two and it's funny that she was already on the sulfur and it wasn't really helping her sleep. So, uh, but that's it's a good point. Nuts and, um, and uh, sulfur are the two highest. I think one of the things that we look for sometimes when we're, you know, doing, looking at our prescription and what it's doing is that when you give the wrong remedy frequently, it aggravates the symptom for which you need to make sure you choose the next remedy. So it helps us in the zigzag. So, it's so, not necessarily the wrong remedy. It could just be that the picture's yeah. changing. It's a, a remedy that's working for a while. And then yeah. the that 3 a.m. thing, you know, right. could indicate, okay, the sulfur's not helping, but the 3 a.m. is getting, that symptom is becoming magnified or has been has been uh, added because when we teach second prescription, we teach it, but that's a new symptom. Zigzagging the case. Zigzagging the case. How often do we do that, Joel? What <laughs> percent of the time? When I first started, there were a few people that always took the same remedy. I haven't had a case like that recently. Oh, oh. Time to exactly. 90%. <laughs> Maybe Nine others, the other 10% because they don't come back. <laughs> so it could be almost 100%. So Dr. Pure and Dr. Shepard say, don't worry. If you're taking the zigzag approach, it's okay. And you're why did, you know, sometimes, you know, we have standards for ourselves that are unrealistic. It's, you know, riding the wild horse. Sometimes, it, you know, it's bucking and sometimes it's going along nice. <laughs> and you should never, you know, be frustrated so that your patient feels that you're giving up on them or, you know, you want to say, stay steady. Exactly. And, and, and okay, give me the symptoms. Okay, let's, let's look at what's happened, you know, to, to keep them on board. Thanks, Francine. Now I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel better that. Bread and butter. I feel better because no steroids were used. But I mean, these are kind of interesting cases for the, the students that are just starting out. These are some, some good keynotes to know. So I'm happy, she's happy, but I'm a perfectionist. I want her to be 100% better. <laughs> and she says, 
my hypertension, my blood pressure is, it's under control. But she says, I'm not happy because I didn't want to go on that nifedipine in the first place. I wanted to do it naturally. She tried diet, she tried exercise, and it didn't help. So I said, well, you know, if we're going after the root of the cause, if this really is a drug reaction, you should go back to your primary um, physician. You should ask him, um, do you think maybe you could try a different drug? You know, because if this is it, if you go to a different class drug, maybe the rash will go away completely. And she said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be on another blood pressure medicine. I want to be off of it and do it naturally. I'm like, well, okay. Well, I said, if there's one thing I've learned, never just stop somebody's blood pressure essential medicine. If you get a stroke, if you get a, you know, a, a heart attack and die, we're going to feel really bad that you didn't ask your primary about the blood pressure and what to do. So I said, you know, so basically say, don't do that. And I said, don't even try this until you ask your, your primary physician. But if he says it's okay, why don't you try taking a low dose of potassium every day and at the same time taking a low dose of magnesium. Now you may say, well, that's kind of a goofy idea. Why did you do that? I said, well, we didn't do it, but we're gonna ask the primary if we could do that. And the idea was there was an anecdotal case in the spiritual book. It wasn't even our medical book, but the spiritual book that I was reading. And um, he said the same thing. My diet and exercise didn't work. My blood pressure was a little too high. My primary is saying, look, you gotta treat you got to treat this blood pressure. And, um, and he said, but I don't want to take a medicine. So his two spiritual advisors said, well, this is a little tip that you can buy at any Walgreens or any drugstore. As long as you follow these two instructions, usually it's really safe. Number one, take both in the same day. Don't just take one. Number two, do not exceed these amounts. Why? Well, because too much electrolytes can give you problems, you know, um, serious problems. So. Uh, so in the anecdote in the book, he says after two months, his blood pressure went down to safe levels and even his family uh, primary physician said, well, I guess whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And um, I guess maybe you don't have to start it. But in our patient, you know, we don't want to have her stop anything. So if it's okay with the primary, we're going to try that. So, but the only thing is we can't really practice medicine just because of one crazy anecdote that I read in a spiritual book, right? So we have to ask ourselves, is there any scientific rationale for doing this. And if there is, or if there's some animal studies, then maybe we can do it. If it's safe, if it's over the counter, if they don't have renal failure, if they don't have, if they're not taking spironolactone like a, a, a potassium sparing uh, diuretic or something like that. But it's nice to have a scientific rationale. So the question is, is there any rationale? Is there any rationale for doing that? Well, pregnancy. Mag yes, sulfur, mag salt IVs. Fun, yeah. Yes, so so case okay. in point, any anybody that's uh, ever delivered babies in family practice, when you were training, like Dr. Fior said, what do you do if somebody gets eclampsia and they start seizing? They give them magnesium through their IV. So that would be that's that's one case in point. Uh, is there any other scientific rationale for combining potassium with magnesium, which is using eclampsia treatment? Well, I did a little looking and. And this is not an alternative medicine journal. This is the New England Journal, a highly respected journal. Everybody knows by now about the DASH diet. This was 1997. Diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension or high blood pressure. And so the idea was everybody knows that vegetarian diets seem to at least help reduce pressure. Uh, at least that's the idea. And if you're eating lots of veggies and fruit, so they decided to check it. And um, that's what they did. They got them off the animal fat and they gave them lots of fresh fruits, basically a, uh, a whole foods plant-based diet. The only difference was they gave them a fair amount of, of dairy foods. DASH is a intermediate diet. Um, the author who came up with the DASH diet knew about whole foods plant-based diet, realized that that was the optimal diet, really? but thought to himself, People won't eat that diet. People won't give up their meat. Right. So he came up with this diet, the DASH diet, which is you do a lot of fruits and vegetables, but you can still eat some. Oh. And the benefits are not the same as a plant. Diet. So it's even not the same. was that Dr. Lawrence J. Apple? I think so. So a doctor, Dr. Fuhrer said this is a very interesting. Well, I mean, one of the authors of the DASH diet. I mean, they, they knew about the data on whole foods and diet, and they said in America, that will apply, we'll come up with a DASH diet, which is basically eat more fruits and vegetables and keep your meat and chicken. That's very interesting. That's a, that's, that's a very interesting aside that I didn't know if I was just reading the article. Yeah. 
Um, Dr. Fior said that in 1997, or when they did the study, one of the authors was saying that basically um, doing a plant-based diet would be better. But back in 1997, people just weren't ready to give up their fish and chicken and, and saturated fat and stuff like that. So he said, we live in a real world, so let's let's do kind of an intermediate diet. It's not as good as plant-based, but heck, it'll still work. And look at it, it worked. And it was significantly um, good at decreasing their blood pressure. So anyway, so this is one rationale for giving people potassium and magnesium. Why? Because when you eat tons of fruits and vegetables, you're getting lots of potassium and magnesium. And if you're eating tons of fruit and vegetables, you're eating less salt and you're getting, you know, the, the yin and yang is this, the, the sodium is balanced by the potassium and magnesium for relaxing the, the blood vessels is that, that I have heard. Also, isn't there, uh, when people go into the hospital, it's a suspected cardiac problem, and it has, you know, spasm of the vessels, then they hear that on spasm. the crash carts, mm -hmm. magnesium. And then yep. they find out they have, I think it was, I read 80, I can't quote you the, the, the literature, but 80% better survival rate for people who can give magnesium than the cardiac. It's a good point. Say. But... This is nice, but I mean, but what if someone, what if that family that calls me up and says, this is a crazy idea, you know, don't you have any, any proof that it would work? Well, I mean, so I could say, well, you know, like a dash diet, but what if they say, well, that's not good enough. Well, so I, I was looking a little further. These cute little rats are part of a study that was done. And this is so cool. They had two groups. Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you, these poor unfortunate rats, um, they get spontaneous high blood pressure, just like we humans do. Isn't that awful? So anyway, they, they got um, a bunch of rats. Half of, they were all the same hypertensive rats spontaneously. And uh, for 10 weeks, some of them got the regular rat feed pellets. And they were just regular standard rat pellets. They were at the control. And the other ones, the intervention group that had high blood pressure, they got three different um, concentrations of potassium, magnesium, liquid supplements that must have been like put into their pellets and dried. And then they looked at them and they found out that uh, giving them by mouth in their food, potassium and magnesium supplements, um, not only lowered their blood pressure, it actually lowered the little rats of blood pressure to even before um, they developed blood pressure in the first place, like when they were adolescents and they didn't have blood pressure. So it even got it below their initial level and, that, and they felt that it was so significant of a difference that it was what you would probably expect if you gave them a blood pressure medicine. Uh, and they looked at three different uh, things, 6%, 9%, and 12%. Um, let's see. The, um, surprisingly, the, the lower dose, uh, I think, even did better. But it was almost equally significant decrease in systolic with the, the 9% and 12%. But so basically what they're saying is the, the, low, the, low, um, the low dose of magnesium and potassium is the way to go, which is funny because in Gary Renard's spiritual book, that's what his uh, spiritual teachers told them. They said, go with the low dose and do not increase the dose. So, but this is the kicker. Look at this. In this animal study, their conclusion was not only does it work in rats, but potassium and magnesium could possibly be used in further human studies to see if it's feasible to normalize humans' blood pressure by reducing the harmful effects of dietary salt. So if you can't get people to decrease the amount of salt they're eating, do some studies to see in humans. So has anybody found a human study which showed that it worked by giving specifically potassium and magnesium? Ah, so Tim says, who's gonna fund a study? Who's gonna fund a study like that? You think it's the anti-hypertensives? Right, so anyway, so- Find a reason not to take this. I asked myself that question, has anybody done that? So I went online and I, and I, now, by the way, anybody that's listening or here personally, if you ever find a study that shows that specifically potassium low dose and magnesium low dose helps for high blood pressure, let me know. Uh, but I haven't found it yet. So anyway, my point is, I'm thinking to myself, man, if I were a medical student, I would be all over this because this would be really easy for me to do. I mean, in, as a third year medical student, Everybody has people that have high blood pressure, right? And chances are, as a medical student, you'll be the one that gets them. You might not get the hardest case where they're on five different antihypertensive and they show up at your doorstep. As a student, they give you the easy ones. You know, the person that's 30 or 40, they gained a few pounds and, um, and they have a little bit of um, high blood pressure, but they've never been treated before. So you're going to see tons of people like that as a medical student. 
what if you just got like 10 or 20 people? It could be just an open label study, just a case series. And all you have to do is Gary Renard, he got better in, in eight weeks. So you could say, okay, take you for eight weeks. It wouldn't even cost you anything. You could, I'm sure you can get the, um, I'm sure you could get the, um, the makers, the makers of, you know, like the, the supplements that you're using, potassium and magnesium. And that would be pretty easy. And that's pretty cheap. They could give you a whole crate of that stuff and use it in New Mexico. As long as you could get it through your IRB, uh, and you could get it through your IRB by not harming anybody. So you wouldn't, for exclusionary criteria, you would say, well, you would propose, we would not experiment on pregnant people. We wouldn't have people that had like end stage renal failure or any type of renal failure. Anybody on any drugs that would make it dangerous to be taking these supplements, anybody that was a kid. But if you phrased it in the right way, I'm almost sure you could get your, your IRB to do it. And it's not like you're gonna have to be, um, you know, spending lots of money on hiring extra nurses because you're gonna be seeing people like that and it'd be simple to do. And, you know, the end point would be eight weeks, what's your systolic blood pressure? So if anybody's interested in that, especially like I'm talking to a lot of people here at National, um, if anybody's interested in a natural study like that, I can't help you get it through the IRB, but I'm sure some of the other professors could, but at least I could help you kind of tweak it and, and I can help you decide what would you like to use for exclusionary criteria, inclusionary criteria, you know, how to write it up, I'd be happy. Just a, a quick question about the magnesium potassium combo. Is, is, are we going to look at if we do them separately or together? Because there are some things about magnesium in general that's going to lead to um, good results. Like sure. know, people that are low in magnesium create trophic. Right. One of the reasons that they say they create trophic. So magnesium Francine said, potassium. Would, it, would it have to be a study of potassium? And magnesium, or would you just do magnesium? Or well, you could do whatever study you want. But uh, I saw some other studies on there where they took, I think it was calcium and potassium, or calcium and magnesium, and it didn't work at all. And calcium is falling out of favor. They're right. More of, right. You know, atherosclerosis and coronary arteries, and more, more risk of heart disease than calcium. All I can say is you've got an animal study that proves it works, you've got a plant based study that shows at least that works. Uh, and plus you have at least anecdotal studies on the internet and, and in the print that say that if you use low dose of both, and it has to be both. So would I do a magnesium only? No, I wouldn't. Um, Tana has a yes, Tana. comment, I don't know. You're unmuted, Tana. Are you there? Yes, if she got off. Uh, Did she get off of my bedding yet? Good question. No, because the last photo I showed you was just like a couple weeks ago. So um, she's asking her uh, family doctor as we speak if it's okay to start the low dose potassium and magnesium. And then I'm gonna see her back in maybe, I don't know, eight weeks, six weeks, something like that. So hopefully you will, maybe in the next meeting or two, maybe I can give you an update. So with that, I'll say thank you. And we'll just maybe have a couple more questions. We'll take a five minute break. No, it's not him. The question is question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to be able to do that. How do you do that? Let me just. Okay. It's a regular thing. How do you do that? Move around. So how do you get from here? I only see it here. I'm showing. I just you can move it. It's just a regular thing. Right, so that. so what you can do is you can make it small again and put it back to where it was. How did you get it from here? I just so, oh. so here, here everything was up here. This right. actually was on the top. So what did you do to get it? I put it on the top. It's just a pin. It's just a window. All of these are windows. This is a window. This is a window. No, oh, this no, is a window. It's the whole thing. Yes. It's part of this. So how did you separate them? Yeah. Mother, it was hot. We would do wrap one of our spray. It's up. It's um honey, hundred percent chocolate you. with no added sugar. Okay. okay, let me just see here. This is a ten days. Okay, so I. Oh, 
so okay so let me just see what i did um oh it's, it's part of this so here if this is attendees right and mm -hmm. this is part of this if mm -hmm. i hit attendees and it makes it a window i can it doesn't make it a window I, okay, let me, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you how I did it. I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, attendees, attendees. Oh, you click on this little thing? Yeah, that little thing. Okay, it's that little button. I, yeah, I did it and I don't remember what I did. Can, right. can I ask you a favor? Yeah. Can, um, I no, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you can get them online, but you don't have one time. You can have to for years. That's a good deal right here, just so you know. And yeah. you know, it's on the about. Um, so what, this is Highland. Yeah, if you take it towards the school on Roosevelt. Oh, is it between Roosevelt and the previous side? Yes. Oh, cool. That's yeah. exactly like that. Yeah. Yep. Right and the funny thing is, they sell so many people wheels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm about to get you one of them. You know, I just, I just take it for when, when it, when it, when it, I know, I'm very I'll, I'll call again today, but I told him I called yesterday. I noticed there's a white sign. I didn't get close enough, but I passed by. Yeah. Greek is closed. They're not doing takeout, they're not doing anything. They went back to Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Which may not have been a very good move. Do you realize? Oh, I know. Well, I work for a restaurant so part time. Yeah, and I was telling people that I go to work. Like a lot of people that take like they have family yeah. and they base it off that. Like my best friend, her boyfriend is pretty much been doing it for ten years. Like the company I know. It's a big company. Yeah, and they really didn't even they have like really and, and the thing is, even if you know, our governor says, okay, come on, don't go everybody open up. How much? I don't know the answer. How many dollars would it take? That could have thrown away all the food and stuff in your in your refrigerator. What would it be? 50000 to stock up a restaurant? Like the big out. I mean, like she did, she did an expensive thing. Now for money. Deal with that magnesium deficiency, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Although five six hundred would be too much for me. What would it be? Diarrhea. Oh, it would. Have you tried it? Bad things and then diarrhea. Good point. So then, if you want to do that, what would you do? Maybe take one or two hundred a mag, and then maybe decrease the potassium at the same time. Why? You have high blood pressure? So, hey, why didn't you tell us? You should have made Look at them all the so time. You never know. It doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> it, uh, it depends on what's 
stress them on this if I go to the dentist. Well, what about the There you go. Hey, you should. When we go back from break, would you just make that comment? Right. And if you don't want to say that it's you, you could say, I have a patient that's more than. There were a lot of questions. Oh, wait, there were like 50 questions. Did you answer? There were a ton of questions. Is there more now? There were a ton. I just did 10 of them, 12 of them. Oh, Dr. Fear, hi. Hi, Amishi. Hi, we got most of the questions answered. Oh, okay. I, I was just going through and answering them. Okay, okay, good, good. No, so yeah. you and Francine uh, both, yeah, yeah, kind of look at them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I, ho I uh, joined a little late today, uh, so I just uh, took the liberty of addressing the questions. I then came to realize that yeah, Dr. Francine probably was doing it too. Uh, just we have I think three or four questions that that are still uh, left to be answered, uh, but otherwise most of them have been. Just okay. the last uh, couple of them, yeah. I see one. I see one hand and one question. Yeah, actually, I see uh, one I hand think, for uh, J, JC uh, Jacinda and one question from Tom Haas. Is that right? Yes, yes, correct. So I don't know the hand for uh, for uh, Miss uh, Lucy. Um, I think Dr. Francine asked her, but there was another hand uh, against her name. So I'm not sure if she has a question, but uh, Tom does have a question. Uh, he has typed it in the panel too. Um, his question is, was the dose, dosing a single dose daily? We'll ask Bob when he gets back. Okay. And then I see Jacinda has a question. Well, I can unmute her now. I'll do it. Okay. Oh. Are you, are you at, the, at the school? No. Nobody's at the school. At Oh, okay. Because it's a quarantine kind of situation, we can't meet at the school. And okay. we're just a small group, just people from the office, basically. Uh, Jacinda, you're <laughs> unmuted. Do you have a question? Okay. Yes, I wanted to ask you to go back to the RAT article so I can get the information to look it up. Oh, the RAT article. 
the rat article. Thank you. Is this the rat article? Yeah, I just wanted to get the information so I can look it up. Online. No, that's a mouse. That's not a rat. That's or a mouse article. Mouse. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it does say rats. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. I just wanted to get the information so I can look it up. Okay, great. Bottom of the question and there's a question form, and then we it's already done after 12. Why don't you text me? I'm on my regular phone. I'll call you later. Okay. Okay, Mary. Bye. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I just missed the pet. You go lock up. Where do I have to go? So, Bob, why don't you? Uh, Tom Haas has a question for you. Why don't you unmute him? Can you just click the button? You see the little orange thing? Click okay. on that. Just click on the yeah. orange thing right No, no, no. Here. Right here. The orange right oh, here. Okay. Click that on one. it to unmute, and it'll say unmute. And then unmute. Hi, Tom. This Hi, is Tom. Bob. Did you have a question for the um, audience here? Hi. No, it's Mari. I by mistake Hi, signed under uh, under Tom. Oh, okay. But my question was answered. I'm the one who asked about the single dosing on cat case number three. Oh yeah. Was yeah. It a, okay, so it was a single dose daily. Uh let's see. Uh, this one here. Uh, the last one. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Well, I think it might have been a BID dose. I think it was twice a day. Okay. Great. Thanks for the information. Great seminar. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, the, the thing about um, a lot of people have different philosophies about causality, but the main thing is the most important thing is just concentrate on getting the right remedy, getting the right sonorum. Um, and then I think then the causality, like, the, like which potency or how frequently, that's kind of like more up to debate but the most important thing is just nail the right remedy and this patient didn't have any aggravations at all before getting any alleviation no she did not phenomenal yeah that has been my challenge is when to actually change the pathology based on the aggravation or alleviation and when to and how long to wait right okay is there any way you can show me slide 37 so i can take a quick look at it so i can read it again Slide 37. 
Was well, that the mouse one? Yes, thank you. I wanted to, I didn't finish reading it. I appreciate yeah. this. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just take a screenshot of this. That's a study a lot of people should know about. It was 1994 and a lot of people still don't know that. Yeah, phenomenal. Very interesting. Thank you so much, doctor. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come back from break right now. We're going to reconvene. And Dr. Tim Fuhr has a few slides which are kind of going to um, help uh, start the discussion on coronavirus and homeopathy. Okay, first I'm just looking through here the questions. Do you have the same thing I did, Tom? You said Tom is stuck? Tom has? Yeah, we already did this. Okay, so it doesn't go through one line, and once you answer it, it doesn't take it off. We would have to refresh it. What do I have to do in order to make it so I don't, I'm not double, double. Uh, I have Tom, Kara, uh, and Ruby having questions. Do you have those three? I'm just answering the question here. What's your email, Bob? At hotmail.com. Kara Cruz is interested in doing that study. Cool. I knew there was a courageous one among them. <laughs> she, 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 she's, so, uh, she's so smoked about all this stuff. Cool. <laughs> Is answering the questions and it just comes off on my screen. Yeah. Well, he can read most of that. It's a very simple question. You answering all the questions, Tim? This is going to be great. This is going to be great. So, but I have all these questions. The senior wants to know if you go back to the RAD article. Yeah, we already did that. You already did all the questions. Yeah, today? yeah. So, I'm going to just delete them all of mine. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, with this epidemic. I mean, uh, we teach at National and the school is closed now. Um, all the classes have moved to online. That's happened uh, nationally. Uh, Illinois now is in a state of uh, shelter at home. Only essential services can go to work. Uh, luckily, that includes healthcare providers, or maybe unluckily for some people, ER doctors who are on the front line of this. Um, it's really affected everything, our economy, um, so do we have anything to offer in, in homeopathy and what, what, are, what are people saying? Now, unfortunately, I don't know that anyone is an expert on this. Anyone that I know is an expert. Um, there are people in China who are treating people who have some idea of what's going on. Um, I'll give some suggestions from, from them. Uh, there are people in Iran, where there's an outbreak in Italy. Uh, Actually, we recently met with a homeopath from Italy, Reno Galazzi. We went out to Greek Islands with him, a few people in the office, and uh, he has some suggestions. And um, so people are giving suggestions, but we don't really, we don't really, the homeopathic experience is not so great. But luckily, um, there is a great homeopathic experience in the literature with treating epidemic diseases, and homeopathy is usually quite successful. In fact, some homeopaths feel that it will take an epic, epidemic disease for homeopathy to become more popular. So let's hope that's true. So these are the some of the prevention and treatment recommendations that are out there. There's really no general consensus. Um, Sankrin has a student 
who was an MD in Iran, who had seven or eight cases which responded to camphora. And the reason they prescribed camphora was because of the sudden collapse. So these were quite sick patients. And so they're using camphora for treatment every six hours, the 1M or maybe 10M if they're more sick, and then camphora uh, for prevention. The Indian government took the unprecedented step of recommending, oh, you're not, you don't have it? No. You're not seeing me. Why is that? I don't oh, know. Uh, be yeah. Didn't in Bob's, um, didn't in Bob's slide presentation exist at home. Okay, change presenter. I'm gonna change presenter. Start looking at questions. I'm gonna change it to up down. I can't see the PowerPoint, so it's not just me. Here you go. So I think that Tom should be able to see it. What about now? Can you see now? Let me, let me just... just look at your screen. Can you uh, see yeah, now? I can see it. Now. Okay, okay, so we're good. Start looking at the questions. And actually, we do have some vets. Uh, uh, Dr. Doyle on the on the line. I see who. Um, it's interesting. Coronavirus is a disease that is more endemic, I think, in pets. So uh, they've actually developed a vaccine, according to Jeff, in the past. So we'll want to be hearing from the vets about what their experiences with coronavirus, coronavirus vaccines, and antivirals are. The Indian government, as I mentioned, took the unprecedented step a while back, a month or two ago, of recommending our Seneca album 30C uh, once a day for three days and then repeat in a month as a prevention for um, coronavirus or for COVID-19. And interestingly enough, I read a post by uh, Isaac Golden that said that the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, the head guy, is taking it. So, Based on the Hong Kong experience, this is some of Schulten's students and experiencing with people that he knows in Hong Kong. They're using gelsimium, 30C, once a day uh, for a week and then twice a week if their case is nearby until all the cases are less, if not, just weekly. Um, Andre has been recommending maybe bryonia, gelsimium, or camphora. Arsenicum is another remedy that's in the mix by some people. So these are prevention and treatment recommendations. Other treatments that people are recommending, vitamin C, D, A, iodine, zinc, I saw a report from China that patients who were really sick did better with Ma Huang, ephedra, which makes sense because they're having respiratory distress and Ma Huang is, is um, kind of like uh, a vasodilator. Many other botanicals, I mean, literally, I saw dozens and dozens of botanicals that could have antiviral properties, some of them against uh, coronavirus. Um, one, uh, Paper said something about cytokine storm. You have to watch the anti uh, the botanicals that you're using. I don't know if there have been any cases. I, I I wonder, but you have to be careful with sambucus, echinacea, and vitamin D because of that, and mushrooms as well. Uh, Lisa Krebs provided that information. There's a comment by Richard. Uh, Jane Doyle said that with the current rate of disease epidemics, I suggested Nostromica may be very good for COVID. Uh, let's let's unmute her. So okay. she wants to add her experience. Do you? Okay. Uh, I'm going to unmute you, Jane. Let me just find you in the list here. Just give me one second. Maybe it's yours. Okay. Jane, I'm getting ready to unmute you. Okay, Jane, you are now unmuted. Okay. I can't hear the question. Do you want to share your experience? And you said something about, you had a comment about Fitkaran has come up with Nux, Nuxlamica as a possible. Yeah, uh, 
Yeah, Dr. Pitcairn, he's a veterinary homeopath and educator. Um, yeah, he worked up and, and sent out his work up to us. And it, it, Nux looks really good. And it's also considering that um, there's a pretty significant diarrhea part of this thing. But um, as far as veterinary corona, are you asking about that? Yes, because apparently coronaviruses are more common in animals than in people, although yeah, they can cause common cold in people. Especially cats. Um, it's really common uh, to see, uh, especially these feral kittens and shelter kittens that have these upper respiratory things. A lot of times that's corona and there is a vaccine. There's a really commonly used combination vaccine, the multivalent. I think it's got four diseases in it and one of them is corona. The other, uh, thing that's about, the other thing about Corona is that it is so, um, you know, viruses mutate just for something to do. And, and Corona does it way more than a lot of other viruses. And so um, there is a disease that we see in cats called feline infectious peritonitis, wherein they've had exposure to a coronavirus. And I think most cats have been exposed to it and we get them through, you know, the upper respiratory thing as kittens, or maybe they don't get sick, but you know, they've got the virus and they've dealt with it. Um, the virus can mutate in the individual cat and then cause this peritonitis disease, which is fatal. Um, I've never had much luck treating it at all. And of course, uh, conventional medicine has precious little to offer as well. Um, so, it, and, and then when they have FIP, which is that feline infectious peritonitis, it's not contagious, which is kind of fascinating, but it's because that, that virus has mutated it for that, for that specific cat. They've tried FIP vaccines. I think there's still one on the market, but it, it's not very good. And I don't have a lot to say about the vaccines because I don't use them much. So I can't really address questions about the vaccine specifically. I think Jeff had a comment about the vaccines. Uh, Jeff? Um, just just that, you know, the, it was the vaccine, originally was the vaccine looking for disease back in the 80s. Um, we were seeing a lot of enteric coronavirus, or at least uh, associated with enteric coronavirus. We don't know if it was actually causative. Um, and Portage and their inimitable wisdom came out with the modified live vaccine that actually killed a bunch of animals and caused pancreatitis or triggered pancreatitis and a lot of others, needless to say, it was quickly pulled off the market. And uh, there was eventually um, another enteric coronavirus um, kill vaccine that, yeah, that became a part of the the sickest one vaccines that a lot of vets give on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, speaking to what Jean said about the FIP and the mutation from the enteric coronavirus to the virulent FIP virus, that I think is perhaps the biggest concern, especially considering, you know, there was one dog that we know was at least exposed or with a positive to the coronavirus. I never, never had symptoms and it was quarantined. And then it went home and died. And that's, that's, you know, of some concern. Yeah. Especially considering it looks like this coronavirus is associated with the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. So, you know, I haven't really heard of anything about any possible effects on the heart or, you know, that system, but, you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's a, a big concern and again, big concern about the safety of any putative or future vaccine. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. In humans, uh, it's interesting in the Chinese experience. In the Chinese experience, in the Chinese experience, um, people who are at higher risk now now it seems like the disease is moving into even younger people are are ending up in the ICUs and on ventilators, but or at least sicker with the disease than going to hospitals. Um, people with hypertension and diabetes. Um, 
are at higher risk. And it's interesting, those people have higher um, ACE2 uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two uh, enzymes on their their lung cells, and that seems to increase. That's where the uh, virus apparently binds to get into the cells. And I at least read a theoretical paper that people on ACE inhibitors and ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, upregulate their ACE two um, enzymes on their lung cells, and so that might be one of the reasons why those people are even higher risk. So it's interesting, the allopathic drugs might make it yeah. uh, make the situation worse by upregulating those enzymes on the cells. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, reg regarding this is uh, Dr. Burke. Let me just speak through you. But in terms of the, those kittens dying and having diarrhea, uh, somebody mentioned to me that works with rescue that veratum was for the collapse with diarrhea, but to prevent the death in these kittens that have they suddenly die very quickly with diarrhea, that might be a remedy that's indicated. We also know China is with the loss of fluids, so I don't know how that would figure into that with animals. Jeff, any comment? Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear um, what Francine's. She she said that uh, veratrum or China for those cats, the kittens that died with the with the diarrhea. Um, when individual us, yeah, for sure. I know. I remember my first case of of a wet form of FIP actually ended up being cured with the with the dose of lycopodium. Ah, very good. So probably the con maybe the chronic remedy. Carolina. But the, and and coincidentally, also one of the remedies that's being used, you know, against the the current COVID. But mm -hmm. um, as Jane indicated, you know, that was beginner's luck back, you know, at the beginning of homeopathy and success in in active FIP, not so much. But that's really a different situation than the acute miasm that we're experiencing right now. FIP, FIP is much more you know, a, a condition of the chronic energetic imbalance of you know, it's, you know, the kittens. And they are prior or associated with over vaccination because we do see it a lot in shelter cats. And that's interesting to me as well that that they're recommending the flu vaccine, but the stats that I've seen say that actually people that get the flu vaccine may be predisposed to a greater morbid morbidity and mortality. Um, and certainly but, there's studies from I think British Columbia that people who get the flu vaccine are more likely to get other respiratory viruses. So yeah. um, for example, I think that was the year they had the swine flu and people that got the regular flu vaccine, we're more likely to get the swine flu vaccine. So I imagine that could be the same case with this uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. Although it seems to be uh, quite infectious, it seems. Yeah. Um, let's continue with a few slides here. Um, we'll do questions in a second. Um, so again, determinants of health, we're all aware of that. Eat more fruits and veggies. Well, again, the vit we're talking about the vitamins, especially vitamin C. Sleep, stress reduction. Uh, Vitulkas critiqued the uh, Iranian cases um, from a uh, Sankaran student. He said, basically, we need to do a randomized controlled trial because, hey, if it's a 3% mortality, 97% of people get better. So no matter what you get them, 97% of people are going to get better. How do we know the remedy's helping? You need to do a randomized controlled trial. 200 people in the hospital, 200 people with the, the uh, both groups with the virus, 200 people with homeopathy and conventional treatment, 200 people just with conventional treatment. I would be very surprised if that study was done because often in situations like this, I mean, when we met with Reno Galazzi, it was very interesting. He was one of the people that when there was an Ebola outbreak, he went with Liga doctors to Liberia, asked the country, can we come there and treat people with uh, um, Ebola? They said, yes, please come. We understand your homeopathic physicians. Please come, we want you here. They got there. The government officials were like, please, the WHO stepped in and said, you will not touch a patient. You will not see a patient. So it can be difficult. They don't really want our, our answers. That's part of the problem. Um, 
he, he made a comment, genus epidemics cannot be spotted in all epidemics. And even when, when we do find it, it doesn't mean all traces are gonna respond to it. So the fact that they had seven cases in a row, you wonder, were those just cherry picked? Was it really seven cases in a row? Did the remedy really have an effect? Were they just picking cases that responded to it? And really the genius epidemic can only be found after treating a lot of cases, maybe 50, and seeing the effects of treatment. Are the patients getting better or not? Are they responding much quicker than you'd expect? What is the accuracy of these test scores? Uh, we'll get to that. I've got that a slide on here about that. It's not so good. Sensitivity is only 59%. Specificity is unknown. Um, with uh, Vitulkis's point, with such cases today developing similar symptoms, it's impossible to found uh, as genus epidemicus might be impossible to find with the level of health currently in society. Uh, and he's, his comment is, why is everyone speculating? Because that's just gonna lead to more chaos. And I think we already have quite a bit of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, process of serious evaluation is needed. Any remedy you may prescribe may have some kind of effect on the patient. So again, it could be a placebo effect. Um, and I'd like to maybe allow Joel to pipe in now about genus epidemicus. Because everyone's, I know I had one when I was on a, this actually I'll mention right now, there is a, a two hour webinar on, um, on coronavirus on the AIH website, homeopathyusa.org. Um, I watched it, it was very good. Uh, Andre Sain presented, gave an excellent presentation on epidemic disease in general and talked about specifically coronavirus. Jennifer Jacobs presented about homeopathic treatment in, uh, in epidemics. Uh, a gentleman from, uh, a doctor from uh, Netherlands presented. Um, there was one more presenter I might've forgotten, but uh, the webinar is available here, it's free. Anyone can watch it on the AAH website. And now, Joel, with genus epidemicus, I know you're writing a paper on that. So instead of, I just forget the word genus epidemicus, I wanna go into why it's so difficult to find a genus epidemicus according to mm -hmm. Hanuman. No, what? Turn around this way. So you're what speaking you, in here. No, speak into the can, can you, uh, Jeff, can you hear us? Can you hear Joel? Wait. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So the history of the term genus epidemicus is not Hahnemannian, but I don't want to get into that. That's more academic mm -hmm. than the moment. So Hahnemann had experience with epidemics in his career, and he wrote to his observations, and I think it gives us lessons to learn about finding the so-called genus epidemicus. Let's take his first observations in 1798 influenza epidemic. He says, quote, it, comp it complicates itself with chronic disease and aggravates it and masks the epidemic remedy, which will also help the chronic. The chronic remedy will not work and the later tendency for the epidemic and chronic symptoms will return after you treat the epidemic. But maybe I said that too fast. So the first people that get the new epidemic disease are the most susceptible. They'll get it most violently and not have a good picture. Then as one- Because it's complicated with the chronic disease. Picture. That's right. So you, it masks the epidemic picture because of the underlying chronic disease. Then we have the, the, the idea that the coronavirus changes, mutates, whatever, you know, modifies itself quickly and easily, even more so than back in 1798 when everyone was in a rural community and it didn't have many bodies to change in. So we have a constantly changing virus with many constitutions, most people with chronic underlying disease, complicating what the genus epidemicus uh, or specific remedy could be. Number two lesson, 1801 scarlet fever. Again, this was rural community based. The Hahnemann used Belladonna. A year later, the same name the allopaths gave for scarlet fever, Belladonna did not work. He had to change the remedy, even though it was given the same name. So in today's day and age, we don't have to wait a year to see the same name disease change characteristics or change their totality of symptom picture. It could change day to day because we have so many people traveling, so many interactions, and uh, so, uh, so many different constitutions, so many chronic diseases, that the picture of the coronavirus in people can change from person to person. What was that comment by the vet? That each cat has their own coronavirus. 
This could happen with this current pandemic. Number three lesson, Typhus 1814, stages. Definitely there are different stages of the disease in a, in a very acute illness, like we have a pneumonia. We can have an inflammatory stage, consolidation stage, uh, res uh, resolution stage, you can name them what you wish, but Poneman to treat successfully typhus had a first stage set of remedies, Brownian rust tox, that only worked for the first two or four days. Then the second stage, he used tyosimus. And even then, and some people had a third stage, which he had uh, used a sweet spirit of nitro, nitric acid. So the serious epidemics are going to have stages, a different remedy for each stage. There's no such thing as one specific remedy for the whole epidemic. Lesson number four, cholera, pretty well known in uh, historically 1830s. First stage, camphor before the diarrhea, right? In the collapse stage, but they didn't have diarrhea yet. As soon as they get the diarrhea, camphor didn't work. They went, uh, Hahnemann went to cuprum or veratrum album. And again, not everyone recovered completely, even after the second stage, and he used more remedies like Brioni and rust tox. Prevention, homeoprophylaxis, as it's called now. Hahnemann talks about that. Only the cuprum worked, and only if the disease was in the locality. What does that mean? If people are susceptible and chronically ill, and you give them a preventive homeopathic remedy, they're going to get symptoms of the remedy. But if, the, if right, if the so they'll be more sick. But if the symptoms, if the disease, so-called, is in them already, then you can try preventive remedy. Camper cannot prevent, said Hahnemann, in this cholera epidemic, and it may worsen it. Right? So that's a warning for modern times about prevention, like using the arsenicum from the Indian government. Not a good idea. All right, one more example from malarial diseases, what Hahnemann called epidemic intermittent fevers. Sort of a semi-quote, paragraphs 240, 241. Each epidemic has its own consistent nature. The complex of symptoms common to all the patients points to the specific remedy for the totality of the case. But some patients are not cured during an epidemic due to the underlying chronic disease. A complete cure only if the chronic disease is treated homeopathically. So that, therefore, the homeopaths are not going right, to ride in like a knight in shining armor and cure people. There's too much chronic disease in the world. will help, and what will be left behind will be people with lots of upper respiratory weaknesses, like sinusitis, allergies, asthma, bronchitis. We have to treat the underlying disease, you know, historically called the underlying, the chronic miasm or the sora. So the, we're not going to see dramatic results anymore with a so-called genus epidemicus for all these different reasons. One more comment. Well, you know, Hahnemann talks about first action and second action, primary action, secondary action. So I'm gonna use that metaphor. Primary action with this disease is fear, xenophobia, you can't escape it. That's the energy of the disease. Science has failed us, mainstream science has failed. There's no treatment, there's no vaccination, there's no prevention. That's the energy of the disease. What would be the reaction or the secondary healing reaction of the life principle? It's to realize that the tribal and national borders are artificial and temporary. There's no strangers. We're all in this together as one family. Thank you, Joel. Back to the practical. No, that's very practical. Okay, we have people raising their hands, like people that have had multiple questions and comments, and then people are ready Go ahead. to save it up. Go ahead. So raise your hand at this time. I'm going to do um, Tom first, and I think that's Mari. I want to make one more comment too that uh, I think Kimalia has an upcoming Whole Health Now has on an upcoming Sunday. COVID uh, seminar on on Sunday. Tomorrow. He's usually very well researched. And Andre is doing another webinar online that's free to everyone. Most people that they die of this COVID-19 die of pneumonia and acute respiratory distress, and then they go into organ failure and such. Um, so he's doing a webinar on treating influenza and pneumonia uh, on, I think, the 28th. 
Saturday. Uh, you can go to his website, homeopathy.ca, and find that. Again, it's a free webinar. Uh, you have to sign up, though. You have to sign up. You'll get a link, and then you can enter with the link. Okay, so I questions. unmuted um, Tom. Is that you, Maury? Can you, Tom? Can you see that you're unmuted? Tom? He doesn't have uh, audio. It's Mark. Mari, can you? Hi, I'm sorry. I just left my raised hand button on. I apologize. I do not have a question. Thank you. Okay. okay. If Carolina had some comments and some questions. Carolina, I'm going to on YouTube. Carolina, are you there? Yes, yes I am here. Um, hi, Carolina. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I have uh, questions for some of those veterinarians, which I listened to yesterday, some veterinarians from the Czech Republic, and they say that regarding these cytokine storms, that they believe that uh, people or patients are much more susceptible in G5 zone. And um, also- it, it, Say that again, in a what zone? In G5, the EMF. Oh, uh, oh, 5G, 5G. 5G, 5G, 5G yeah. 5G. Yeah, uh, but, they are much more susceptible in 5G. The new cell phone connections, yeah. Yeah, and um, also, um, and this is just the, from the veterinarians from the Czech Republic. They say that it's uh, that it can mutate in individuals. And uh, so I have a question: What would the veterinarians here in the U.S. would they think that uh, if it mutates, can we have different strains uh, throughout the globe, or can even individual, if let's say I contract it, contract it, do I have a diff? Can I have a different strain? of the uh, COVID-19 that my friend, let's say. And, well, that's exactly uh, what Jane uh, jo Doyle said, that some animals end up with their own strain, it seems. And mm -hmm. I've heard reports that some people are speculating that because of the, the epidemic seems to be changing in different parts, that maybe already that's happening with this virus. Mm -hmm. But I think really, bottom line, no one really knows. There's a lot of uncertainty and that's, probably what's driving a lot of the fear is the uncertainty. And one of the major symptoms that people in the Czech Republic have, they have major excruciating headaches. And that's one of the main reasons why they call ER. So I just wonder what would be the remedy for this excruciating headache with the fever? Of course, they have other symptoms, but this is one of the most important uh, main symptoms. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, then you think of remedies like maybe belladonna, bryonia, remedies that have severe headaches, maybe maybe natrum. I don't know. I mean, unless you treat, unless you treat them, you don't know. And right, you start worrying about maybe it's an encephalitic condition. In the U.S., what I'm hearing is more uh, people are are getting uh, upper respiratory, and then the main symptom is shortness of breath. And it's mm -hmm. interesting that the receptors, the receptors for this virus, the ACE2 receptors, if they have the right virus, again, that's questionable because the testing is questionable a bit, um, are mainly in the lung, the intestines, and um, like the kidneys, not so much in the, I don't think about the brain or anything like that. So it's, you know, who knows, maybe in the Czech Republic already, it's a different strain or something. We just, again, these things are all good questions. We just don't know. There's a lot more questions and answers with this epidemic. Hey, Tama, Tamil, you've been unmuted. Do you have some questions? Yes, uh, thanks so much. I am taking this to the next step, and I might be premature, but I was just wondering how I can use my study group members as people who are actually studying these remedies now, uh, first line, second line, so we can help people in our community maybe you know, be proactively planning a clinic setup or something like that. What are your ideas on that? I have... Uh... Part of the presentation here, I have two articles, uh, one from Reno Galassi from Italy, who has kind of compiled Materia Medica of remedies useful. A lot of the ones we've talked about, a few others that are useful and the clinical symptoms that you would use to treat. Uh, Paul Hurst, on his website, has uh, a list of remedies and indications, and he's keeping track of like, okay, which indications for which remedies. One of the problems with treating an epidemic like this could be that 
Um, for example, I saw a case of when I was looking up articles for this uh, for this presentation that um, there was a case of influenza treated by phosphorus and the patient wasn't thirsty. So sometimes we can have uh, certain remedies that are helpful, but it might be unusual presentations of the remedy uh, that's useful. Um, one of the sources said for COVID, consider Ipecac for maybe uh, they have you know vomiting or cough or something like that, but or maybe just hemorrhage, like hemorrhage in the bowels, uh, and maybe not nausea or vomiting. Uh, so it could be a remedy that we know, but an unusual presentation of a remedy that we know. So you know that's a that's a good point. Hopefully we'll get to some of that, and I'll. I don't know if it's possible. I will probably share. I will share with Amishi um, the two articles that I have. One is from 1918, a homeopathic recorder article on influenza. When they were literally, they ran out of undertakers. They had bodies piling up. So many people died. Um, and the homeopath talks about his experience that homeopaths did really well. Patients who got homeopathic treatment did really well, unless they'd already had a lot of aspirin, which we now know is not a good thing. And it's interesting, in this outbreak, they're also saying that avoid NSAIDs, don't take Advil. They're recommending Tylenol, but you know, for us as homeopaths, we don't even recommend Tylenol because it changes the symptoms. We're not gonna be able to find a unique picture. And as Joel mentioned, already things are difficult enough. We have people that are chronically sick, taking drugs, getting a lot of immunizations. The, the picture, the chronic picture is difficult. And then on top of this, they're getting this acute, possibly dissimilar disease mixed in, I kind of complex situation. Uh, you know, we don't want to make our job more difficult in an acute situation by giving Tylenol. I encourage people not to give Tylenol. Excellent. Okay. Just so that people understand principles of prescribing or when to epicurize. Yep. We have thirstlessness during heat. Yes, and, and the phosphorus is there, right? Phosphorus is, it a, is grade two. Grade two. The 120 remedy. So, so we sometimes we have to necessarily we don't want to dismiss remedy because you know it as a keynote. We're really not we're not prescribing via keynotes. We want to go by, we really should, uh, the, the best way to prescribe is always to take a good case, repertorize, and then study the material medical. I mean, that's really the gold standard. Andy, go ahead. Candy, I'm going to unmute you. Um, so I'm going to hear. Okay, Candy, you're unmuted. Uh, hi, uh, hello? Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. We hear you. Um, my question is um, to all the practicing doctors and Dr. Fior. I know you had mentioned in class that you had a patient that had recently gotten back from Italy and was concerned that they did have the virus and that they were going to be tested. So I was just wondering if anybody has had any experience with a patient that has tested positive for the virus and did you take the case and you know what did, what were your recommendations etc she was not a patient of mine but I, I treated her mother but i treated her acutely she had already taken interestingly enough she had already taken oscillococcinum which you can't really get anymore at least on some of the shelves it's gone and she was already better when she talked to me i prescribed arsenicum and she she i talked to her two days later she was better her influenza b test came back positive for uh covid uh her it's actually the virus is the SARS COVID-2 test came back um, negative. But she was in Italy when the outbreak was there. She was around people with the outbreak. So that could be a false, uh, a, could be a false negative, but it's unlikely because she was positive for influenza. Now, I know Dr. Shepard had a patient, a paramedic, I believe, who was exposed to definitely a person who was positive and interesting enough, I think the patient refused to be tested. No, they would not test her because she didn't have high enough fever because we had prescribed oscillococcin and she was doing better the next day. So there is some, and I've seen with the seasonal flu this year, oscillo is working. Influenzinum is what we usually recommend. I'm not seeing so much, a little bit of response with influenzinum. That's usually a 30C that we give. Oscillo seems to be working, but see if you can get it. Okay. Now, today? I was here yesterday. I was at Whole Foods a few days ago. I was at Whole Foods. It was sold out, and they said we're not expecting any. Oscillo? Yeah. So good question. Any? Uh, did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Good. Doctor Fear, I have a few questions from Doctor Dunn. Yeah. Uh, 
Dr. Dunn is asking, uh, uh, going back to the feline coronavirus, does it jump to humans? I, I remember the speaker saying that the peritonitis, when the stage of peritonitis is reached, uh, the, it's not contagious. But what about the stage before? Uh, so Dr. Dan is asking, does the feline coronavirus jump to humans? Well, I think I'll, I'll let the vets answer that, um, either uh, Jane or, or Jeff. Uh, I know um, what they're thinking is this started in Wuhan, which I don't know if this is true or not. There is apparently a bioweapons lab in Wuhan. So yeah. you wonder about that. But there's also uh, 5G has been rolled out there. So you wonder about that. But I mean, those are both, who knows? But apparently it started in a, uh, an animal market where they take exotic animals and sell them to people. And apparently a bat or a, another type of animal that's pangolin or something, something particular to, to China is where they think that's that cross reactivity there started. So it went from the animals to, to people. Do, do the vets want to make any other comment on that? Um, yeah, there is no evidence and there has never been a case of a coronavirus in a cat causing a person, but oh, if they're asymptomatic, they never would have been, you know, we wouldn't be investigating for that. So we don't know, but. So this um, would be, a, this would be a first of, of uh, if this was true from Wuhan that it was transferred over, that would be a first? Uh, not of any coronavirus, but we're talking about the feline and uh, coronavirus. Got yeah. it. Got it. Okay. And I'm not even aware of replication of this virus, you know, in the intestines, because that was going to be my, one of my questions is infectivity of stool. Stool isn't, uh, does have virus in it, but I don't know that any cases have been shown to be transmitted by stool. But again, as mm. a virus changes, as the epidemic changes, and GI yeah. symptoms are a part of the picture, but not a big part. The biggest part is the shortness of breath and the yeah. pneumonia and respiratory distress syndrome. Yeah. Oh, so the feline coronavirus is not transmitted to humans? Correct, that's, that's what you said. Okay. Okay. And then no, uh, no, I think no reported Dr. cases. No reported cases. Okay. And then Dr. Dunn also has another question for um, uh, regarding uh, the animals. What questions should patients ask the shelters who request uh, temporarily uh, hosting or uh, sorry hosting kittens or cats or dogs uh, prior to accepting the animals? That, that's a great question. And again, the WHO and others are saying to use caution if the animal's exposed, but that it should be totally fine. There really is no specific questions you need to ask unless you're being adopted out. You know, uh, you're getting a new pet from somebody that you know was sick and infected, and that's why the animal ended up in the shelter. But they're trying to, you know, they're trying to impress on people that it's safe to rescue and live with, you know, um, dogs and cats that come from the shelter. Okay. Let's do one more question. Right. Thank we'll you. Well, okay, sure. um, I, I have uh, Tana also raised your hand again, but I have a question before I do that. Belinda Smith has written a comment here, more or less. She said she's experiencing the headache portion. And hmm. Leona is working. Leona is working very well for her today. Ah, very good. Um, is so, she has she touched the problem? I'm not assuming that she has. I, okay. I have to unmute her if she wants to make that comment. Um, uh, maybe, maybe we'll do that. Okay. Fine. What we'll about Tana? She's going to. She raised her hand. So let me unmute her. Um, Doesn't look like. Send an unmute request. She has a. Tana, are you there? No. Oh, no. Oh, here she is. Tana. Camera. Yeah, thank you. I accidentally had my hand up, I suppose. I'm sorry, Tim. I came on your screen. What, what was your comment? I think my hand was accidentally up. Accidentally up. Okay. okay gotcha. Let's continue. So this is one source, um, the AIH. I mentioned Kim Alia. I mentioned Andre Sainz next weekend. Um, we need to get ourselves up, up to speed on, on remedies that we can use. Um, the test, it's very interesting. This is from a fact sheet from the CDC. 
and they admit this is for healthcare workers. This is not for the general public consumption. Basically, everyone in the public assumes if I get a positive test, I have the disease. If I get a negative test, I don't have the disease. Is that true? Absolutely not. There's risks of false positives. Um, and what's and they even in this paper, they even talk about what the risks are. You're going to be unnecessarily isolated. You're going to have more contact. You're going to be isolated maybe in the hospital with COVID patients. It might increase your risk and you're not going to be able to work. And if you have an underlying condition instead of, of this, because of a false positive, you're not going to get that treated. And you're going to be unnecessarily treated with now they're using hydroxychloroquine, you know, a drug that could potentially cause blindness. Maybe not so good. There's also risks of false negatives. And I think the, the sensitivity of the test is around 59% one study showed comparing it to CTs. The problem is culture is probably the gold standard, but they can't culture this virus. They, no one's really done it. So they use CTs and it's about 59%. It correlates with the CT findings. So the sensitivity is only 59%. That means maybe 40% of people are gonna be negative who have the disease. So then you have to test again. And then you see, is it positive or negative? So there's, there's problems with the test. The risks of false negatives, it doesn't rule out COVID. Basically, you have to look at the clinical scenario if someone looks like they're COVID disease. And you'll notice there's COVID and then there's SARS-CoV-2. This is the name of the virus that they are pretty sure causes COVID, but COVID is the clinical disease. You could have COVID-19 patients who are negative for the test, but they still have the syndrome that looks like it. So, so it doesn't, that's not the sole criteria. Continue retesting, and on retest, it could go from negative to positive. Um, and the risk of false negatives, you tell someone they don't have it, they walk around, they spread it to everyone else. So the test could actually give us a false sense of security and actually could increase spread of the disease. I was shocked when I read that in the CDC pamphlet on the test. Sensitivity, probably about 59%. Specificity is unknown. I found a 2004 article about the SARS, because this is this virus is called the SARS uh, coronavirus 2. Um, SARS is the SARS coronavirus 1. Uh, that test had, they assumed it had a sensitivity of about 90% or so. Um, we don't really know with this test how specific, how specific it is. Uh, you'd have to test a population specificity has to to do with the true negative rate if someone has a negative test without the disease you'd have to test a population that didn't have the illness and see how many of them came positive no one's done that so we don't really know what that what that number is because they're only testing it in populations which are high risk of the disease um some there can be cross reactivity with other coronaviruses which just cause common cold There are websites galore. Here's one, Illinois Department of Public Health, um, 585 cases, five deaths, so about a, that's a 1% mortality, but that's just of confirmed cases. Um, there's a lot more people that are sick than that. And probably as they're testing more people, that's not a lot of people, that's not a lot of tests, they've done 4,000 tests. As I understand in the United States, they're testing now about 125,000, 125 people per million. In other countries in Europe, they're testing like 5,000 people per million. So our testing <laughs> is still very low. That could be a good thing or a bad thing, as I just mentioned. Uh, we don't know. Yes, Jeff? Someone had a comment? Uh, nope, uh, just, nope, sorry. I didn't realize I wasn't muted, sorry. Okay, um, so, you know, here's the Illinois Department of Public Health website. They update us on a regular basis. Uh, this is a global, uh, excuse me, this is a global website uh, here, which the link doesn't work, sorry about that. But there is a global website which shows countries. Right now, Italy has more deaths than in China. In China, it seems to have plateaued and there are not so many more deaths. In Italy, they have more deaths. And I heard one article that they have 6,000 respirators in, in uh, Italy. They're estimating they need 30,000. So people are gonna be dying because they don't have equipment. It's, it's really a, a huge issue there. Uh, and then the last thing I have is two, this is from a paper from Reno Galassi, I'll show you if you like. And 
the 1918-1919 influenza uh, article. Let me get out of the presentation. I'll show you those articles. And just to show you remedies that we should consider. This is kind of the bread and butter for us homeopaths. We always think about individual remedies. Uh, first, the one, the more recent one from uh, Reno Galassi put together. You can see it. Uh, early stage, Gelsimium, Bryonia, Ferrum Foss. Uh, I think someone on the webinar was mentioning Ferrum Foss. Um, Ferrum Foss is a, usually for acutes, we think of uh, Belladonna, Aconite, and Ferrum Foss. They all have high fever. Um, Aconite and Ferrum Foss are thirsty. Uh, a belladonna is usually not thirsty. They can all have flushed face, high fever, sudden onset. Eupatorium with the bone pain, belladonna, arsenicum. And then later stages, arsenicum, phosphorus, antimonium tart, stanum metallicum. I think you could include uh, camphora in there, probably carbo veg. A few hints from the pandemic, renal glossy. First stage, very similar to the flu. The remedies in order of importance of frequency, at least in Italy, Bryonia, Gesomium, Ferrum Foss, Belladonna, Eupatorium, Nux, Aconite, Arsenicum, remedies we've already mentioned. Uh, Bryonia, there's a dryness, impeded respiration, can't breathe deep, the hacking cough, and the bursting headache. It's interesting that one student said that uh, she had a headache and it was helped with Bryonia. Stitching in the chest, worse motion, great thirst for large quantities or warm drinks, which relieve. They could also be thirstless, or the way I think about brownie, they don't want to move, so they might be thirsty, but they don't want to drink. Um, how can somebody get the link to the webinar? I know China's on the phone. You sent her a link, or did it come through? You'll have to look in your email. Uh, okay. You'll have to send her an email. Why don't you do this? Why don't you send me a text? Gelsimium no, could have a headache. We think of dull, drowsy, dopey. Um, no thirst, chilly, and the chills in the hands or chills running up and down the back, hands and feet cold, wants to lie still. And they don't have the fear and tossing about or excessive thirst of aconite. On the AIH webinar, one uh, participant uh, commented that they were seeing a lot of flu cases and people were freaked out. Uh, that's one of the reasons they're recommending the arsenicum because of the anxiety about the illness. But also, this person said that aconite was a very good remedy. People are freaked out. You give them, if it's, you catch it early, you might be able to stop the whole thing. Um, Ferrum Foss, passive congestion inflammation, red face, first stage, sudden onset, high temperature flushing. Better with motion. He, he tends to emphasize this loquacity and mirth. They joke, laugh, and chatter, even though they have 105 fever. In practice, I, I haven't seen it. It's in the books. Um, There's some cases from Farrington, a couple cases uh, of, of, of Ferrum Foss like this. The way I look for Ferrum Foss is usually I look at the pulse. And in Aconite and Belladonna, the pulse is bounding. In Ferrum Foss, it's like those two, but it tends to be, they look the same, sudden onset, flushed face, similar to aconite as it does is thirsty, but the, the pulse is easily compressible. So I think of it like a, like a belladon or aconite, but the person is the underlying constitution is, is kind of weaker. So the pulse, you can press on it and it goes away. You can't do that with aconite and belladonna. Belladonna, we all know the, 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 uh, the headache, the pounding. Um, with the belladonna, I'm usually looking for uh, cold hands and feet with a hot head. Um, Eupatorium, like the bones are breaking. I know Joel had a good case of uh, malaria that uh, responded with uh, Eupatorium based on that symptom. The paramedic, she, her description was, uh, Cassandra took the case, she's not here today, that she was hit by a bat. Like hit by a bat. But uh, we just gave her Oslo because she wasn't the patient of record. Uh, so that would be another indication that it could have been eupatorium, and then she was very sleepy and chilly, so it could have been gelsinium. We don't know. Okay. Uh, it tends to be a thirsty remedy. Uh, uh, let's see, thirsty. 
Uh, worse motion, thirsty for cold, vomiting. A lot of vomiting. Uh, Nux vomica it tends to have this bruised feeling of the abdominal muscles from the coughing. Cough is worse cold, better warm, and very chilly, worse moving and irritable. So that's the first phase. The second phase, um, phosphorus, of course, from the pneumonia, arsenicum, heifer salt, antimonium tart. Um, Ashley and I had a patient yesterday who responded to antimonium tart. She has a chronic asthma and has been worse, a little worse lately. And the big symptom there was she had a, a cough was worse and shortness of breath and she was very sleepy with the cough. Cali carb, pulsatilla, silica, sulfur. And if the patient is really bad, they're getting drowsy and puffing respiration. Think of opium, carboved if they're hypoxic. That's one of the things about these uh, the people that are ending up in ICU, they're ending up with a lot of hypoxia. Their oxygen sats are really going down. Their CO2 levels aren't coming up, but their oxygen sats are really low. Those are the ones that are uh, that they're intubating. Stanum metallicum and caliodum. Stanum, of course, their chest is very weak, can't talk, empty feeling in the chest, in the cough by talking, singing, laughing, cough talking, you think of phosphorus too, lying on the right side from drinking anything warm. Caliodum, pulmonary edema, and consolidation of lungs. Can so, you send us this? Um, tell me the phrase of like this particular document. Can you get this? I will post it on uh, on Signet for the students for Homeopathy 3, and I'll send it to Amishi, and I'll send it to Francine. I'll send it to everyone here. <laughs> and we should send around, uh, send around our uh, attendance. Oh. Have a there you go. My name on there too. One more thing, uh, I'll go over this article from 1918. It's, it's funny how times change, but everything's still the same. Um, this is Guy Buckley Stearns. He was a homeopath in the early 1900s. Um, he developed autonomic reflex testing in the study of homeopathic preparation, which is interesting. But here's his report from the homeopathic reporting 1918. So this was right in the midst of the epidemic. They were literally bodily piling up. He says, in many towns throughout this country during the recent influence of the epidemic, numbers of dead lay unburied because of dearth of undertakers, coffins, and grave diggers. And this, this attacked more people between 15 and 40. Of course, this was right during uh, World War I. And a lot of people, young people, were sent to barracks, and they were in very crowded uh, circumstances and getting ready to go to war, talk about stress, and they knew their chance of mortality was very high. Um, so you wonder about those factors, but that's why it was mainly, probably maybe one of the contributing factors was mainly young people. It struck isolated mining camps on the top of the Andes and fishing vessels, which for months had been out of contact with the shore. Kind of like this uh, pandemic, it's everywhere. Every continent has cases. Uh, certain states, like in the US, New York is really hard hit. Um, Seattle, a nursing home there, really bad. Um, one other state I can't think of, California maybe, it's pretty hard hit. Those are the worst states right now. Dale's on his question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dale, I'm going to unmute you. Are you still unmuted? Are you there? Hmm? Dale? Me? Dale? Oh, well, let's go back a bit. Um, uh, going back to late December, January, I had a couple of uh, cases which appeared to me to be um, influenza-like or perhaps severe head cold. The uh, outstanding uh, feature was this um, headache that was um, either uh, frontal, which moved to the vertex, or vertex, which moved to the front. And there were some other signs and symptoms related to unique aspects of these. I'm thinking of these two patients in particular. Uh, one was an arsenicum patient who did pretty well for other things, but not the headache or the dyspnea. And uh, the other, Nature Muriaticum, uh, did pretty well. 
uh, with the salt cravings and some other issues, but again, not the headache. Uh, the dyspnea or the chest tension uh, resolved slightly. I was discussing this with a couple of contacts I have out on the West Coast um, who are on the front lines right now up in Washington. And they mentioned, um, we were commiserating about the headache. They, they mentioned a small remedy, which I hadn't considered that uh, they have been using uh, either uh, singly or in alternation with say a remedy like Natmur or uh, arsenicum or, you know, Brionia. What was it? Uh, Tusilago. I've, I've heard that, yeah. Tusilago pethocytes. Pethocytes, and the reason I'm saying pethocytes is just because um, apparently uh, there are, there's more than one Tusilago. And they were pretty, uh, they were pretty clear that it's definitely the pedicytes version. And here we go. this is the remedy right here, uh, Tislago pedicytes. Apparently yeah. it's in Allen's encyclopedia and there's there's a fair amount of mature medicine. Sometimes people recommend remedies. There's nothing in the in the books on it, but uh, Tislago pedicytes, apparently there is some literature on it. Yeah, and the, uh, th there does seem to be a significant amount of heat, at least in their patients, this, this headache issue and the uh, dyspnea. And they seem to be having good response uh, in probably an N of 10 total. Um, they commiserate with each other. And also, um, now the issue here is there's some alternation. So they might alternate this particular remedy, small remedy for unresolved issues like the dyspnea or the head head pain in alternate alternation with um, other more, you know, larger remedies that, that appear to affect the larger picture for the patient. So in this case, maybe arsenicum or Brionia or gelsimium. And they seem to be having, at least they've explained to me that that's a good remedy, small as it is, to, to uh, for us to consider. Do you have it? No. Okay. I'm not sure where we can get it. Uh, we'll have to order it. Uh, it's actually the common name is Butterbur. Yeah, it's Butterbur, right. No, okay. Now, naturopathically or, or nutritionally, it's used for other things like migraine headache, but um, in, in um, you know, macro doses. So anyway, it's just something to um, Use it? Butterbur. to consider. Butter beer. Here it has, it's, it's similar, it looks similar to gelsimia. It has dullness of the head. Here I'm looking up in Allen's Encyclopedia, Tussilago pedicytes, uh, dizziness on waking, vertigo, dullness of the head, dullness and heaviness of the head, dull headache in the forehead, transient, constant, left side of the upper part of the forehead, so extending slowly over the vertex, which is exactly what you described, the vertex to forehead or back and forth. Yeah. Um, One uh, even, I think, like tearing pain. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, and I did see in the literature, people were talking about this, uh, about this remedy. Let's see what the lung symptoms, the chest symptoms are. Tightness of the chest, oppression of the right side of the chest. The interesting thing about the uh, um, pneumonia, it's more of a ground glass appearance. It's a patchy pneumonia, and it's usually bilateral. Yeah. Oh, you mean with COVID, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's... Uh, Something to look at. We're going to have to order this remedy. So, you Until you look, why doesn't someone look it up online? See where it's available. Look it up online. I just okay. look to, uh, you see the name? Uh, Tussilago Pedicides. If someone can look it up, I just do a Google search and see, say 30C or 200C, see where it's available. Um, Unfortunately, Boron is getting rid of a lot of smaller remedies. I would doubt that they have it, so you'd have to go to another ABC source. ABC homeopathy. So ABC homeopathy has it. It looks like they do. Hahnemann um, might. Hahnemann maybe. Especially since California, yeah, they're in California. Yeah, and also natural uh, NHS natural health supply out of New Mexico. Give them a try. Okay. What's it called? NHS Health Supply? 
natural, natural health supply. Health supply. They um, out of New Mexico. Natural. I just call it NHS. I label my remedies NHS. Natural health supply. They're in New Mexico. They hand succuss uh, up to 30 C. They they have some they have some good remedies and also some nice kits. Okay. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Dale. Uh huh. Welcome. Uh, very good. Um, boards of Health assured the public they had the epidemic under control. There was no control. I think uh, the public health officials seem to be pretty tenuous this time. They realized this could be bad because in China it was so bad and so many people died. And now in Italy, they're having the same experience. And actually in Italy now, they have more deaths than in China. Um, uh, aspirin and acilinide. Well, we know, uh, Harry says it's contributed to many of the unburied dead. And even now in this epidemic, we know back then in the influenza pandemic, we know aspirin caused rise syndrome, which caused people to die. Now they're knowing that more people on NSAIDs do worse and end up in the ICU. So avoid NSAIDs. Many wise physicians gave no medicines, retired, in, re relied entirely on nursing. Experience show that there are polyquist remedies covering the usual manifestations, and it is among these that drugs successful are found. Where the suitable remedy has been given and given sufficiently early, death does not occur. And this is, if you look at, um, posted on Andre's website under uh, talks with um, skeptics, with um, the gentleman from uh, Yale, um, uh, I forget his name. Uh, Andre had a debate with him and the person said, well, what, he's a neurologist, what's your, the best evidence for homeopathy? And Andre said, really, it's the homeopathic treatment of pneumonia. And if you look at the AIH webinar, Andre presents that homeopaths were able to get uh, historically, even today, uh, rates of death from pneumonia in the hospital, like 13, 14%. Uh, homeopaths through history, through the last 200 years, have had death rates closer to two, three, four percent So much better. Lecture. Yep. They want, they want to hold help now. Um, under uh, webinars and then clicking onto free casts, archives. So whole health now, you can see Andre's uh, webinar there. It's free cast. Free cast. Um, and then now he mentioned some remedies and these are pertinent today too. Um, arsenicum and the keynotes, prostration, restless, thirst for small amounts, chili, midnight aggravation. And here he makes an observation that the most virulent cases occur among those who have been, had immunizing inoculation against typhoid and smallpox. And in these cases, arsenic has often been most indicated. In fact, I saw reports that because of the military recruits were dying, all, most, virtually all of them had been immunized once they got into the smallpox when they got into the military. And some homeopaths wondered if that was one of the reasons why so many of them died when they got the influenza, that, that had some type of a potentiating factor. Bryonia, sore, wants to be quiet, a headache, uh, worse from motion, like curled up like a dog, mouth dry, with or without thirst, sharp pains in the chest, headache worse from coughing. Not only the influenza, but the ensuing pneumonia. And they want to lie on the affected side, although in this illness it's on both sides. Gelsimia, besotted, heavy eyelids, lack of thirst, chilliness up the back, band like headache, ptosis of the upper lids. Eupatorium, aching, chilly, thirst, sweat. Belladonna, mental excitement, staring eyes, uh, classy eyes, brightly flushed face, 3 p.m. onset. Uh, hyacinthus, night delirium, throwing off the covers, picking at the bedclothes, swords. Um, at nighttime delirium, I have found Often, Baptisia is a remedy that's useful for that. I've had a few cases in the last few years that Baptisia is useful for. Whenever I see delirium in a case of a person with like a flu-like illness, um, I, you have to consider Baptisia. I don't see it listed here, but I would consider that as well. Uh, and then in pneumonias, Varechum viride, they have a very high fever and then a red streak down the center of the tongue. Phosphorus, we all know the symptoms of phosphorus. Tight chest, hoarse, evening aggravation, they want ice cold drinks, can't lie on the left side. But as I said, it could be thirstless with fever as well. So we have to be careful that fits the other elements of it. You don't, you can sometimes prescribe it and successfully. And then hemorrhages. Antimonium tart, they tend to be sleepy, blue lips, quite cyanotic, cold sweat, rattling. And then sulfur cases that resolve slowly, the red lips, more thirst, restless, sleeping cat naps, the feet burning. 
wants a cool place like Bob's case, so it's uncover the feet. It's heifer, soft, croupy, and loose, chilly, sweaty, crave acid. Ipecac hemorrhages with nausea, might not have vomiting. They list capsicum, camphor, very extreme prostration. And the big thing about camphor, the times I've prescribed it successfully, the patient, here they say when they feel too hot, they want to be covered, but when they feel too cold, they want to uncover. The times I've seen it is the patient is chilly, but they want to be uncovered, or their feet are cold, but they want to uncover. Iodine, they mention. Um, and then he gives these recommendations, no aspirin, sweating, cathartics, quinine, yada, yada. For all that they do is change the symptoms and mask the case without being curative. So drink plenty of water, eat only if hungry, and then nothing except milk, fruit, cereals, and stay in bed. I mean, this advice would, would work today. Although try getting a patient not to take Tylenol or Advil or something like that. Although Advil may be being easier to sell now because even the authorities are saying that. But trying to get them not to take Tylenol, it's not so easy. Then you can suggest something like a wet sock treatment to bring down your feet. Uh, you have the wet sock treatment. Basically, you wring, uh, you take cotton socks, you put them under cold water, you wring them out, you put them on your feet, you put wool socks over, and you go to sleep like that. Uh, I know once I had a fever that was going on, and I did you can do the whole body, where you put a, a cool bl uh, blanket under water, and you wring it out, and you wrap yourself, and then go under covers. You can do that, too. You have to be a little braver to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know who the study's by, but they released a study where I see the medicine where you take that to lower the fever and you can to cover it of regulating receptors for the virus. So, ah. yeah. so uh, Ashley mentions in a study that when you take Tylenol to lower the fever, you upregulate the receptors, probably the ACE2 uh, receptors, yeah. so it actually makes it worse. I know there are studies in chickenpox that when you take uh, Tylenol, you delay the time to crusting, which is when the viremia goes away, so you're actually prolonging the illness. When you have an ailment this deadly, do you really want to prolong the ailment? Because that basically, the longer you're sick, the better the chance that that's going to be the end of the story. That's all I have. Let's do questions. And then I think we're done. Okay, I, I was asked to type the, the, the Tisilago, whatever it is, I typed the name and sent it to all. Good. I told the students that it's going to be posted. Um, and I'll send, do you guys want, I'll send this unburied dead, uh, the pointers. Uh, here's a thing on uh, um, the, the PCR test versus chest CT. It's really amazing uh, in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of the test. It's, it's not what you think. And I can send my PowerPoint too if you guys want. I'll make it a PDF. Any other questions? What, yeah, I had a question. What about um, um, that Bhakti? Manish Bhakti's article was pretty good. He had a repertorization at the end. They had looked at the common symptoms, so it's a place to start. What about that particular um, link? Yeah, that's good. There's there's I, a ton of stuff out there. A lot of people are speculating. I think Vatilkas' point is good. We really, I think the best thing you can do is individualize. If people are asking you what to do, you can recommend some of the remedies we mentioned for the first stage as a preventative. Some people are saying, um, I used, I was saying, we were saying oscillococcinum, but if you can't get that, because oscillo has, we have evidence it does work in cases, it seems like, COVID-like cases. Okay. Uh, otherwise, arsenicum, gelsimium, bryonia, Campora, probably not that easily available. The problem yeah. is, what can they get? So make sure you have a range of things. Um, on the AIH webinar, one of the uh, homeopaths from Netherlands said what he's having people do is take uh, gelsimium in the morning, 30C, bryony at noon, and arsenicum at night. This, isn't that what we say? 30C is the every day. To start doing that? <laughs> that's a problem to do that. I mean, we... Could be. I'm just saying what people are saying, but that's the problem. We don't really know. <laughs> So, I mean, there's a lot out there, and what's correct, we, we unfortunately, we just don't know. Thanks, Tim. That was really, really helpful. Any other questions? Any other questions? And, and Dr. Trevor, thank you. Thank other you. questions? Very good. I don't have anything. Okay. All right, let's end the webinar.
Dr. Fear, I had a quick question for Dr. Uh, Shepard, not related to the webinar, but to the renewal. If, yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Shepard. Yes, hi. Hi, uh, Doctor, if you get a chance, can you please email me uh, the names who have sent in the paper renewal? So, uh, you know, we have a couple new applications. I'd like your snail mail so I can mail you the documents. Okay, I will uh, email it to you. Okay, Actually, I will and, do then, it right uh, now. And, I'll, and then I'll snail mail all the other things too, the, the whole list. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so we just need to say send us the list. That's also the email me for address. I have all the people that have paid their dues. She wants oh, all that. that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Butterbeer. <laughs> so that's well, there's, there's a lot of herbs mentioned in Harry Potter just here and there. <laughs> no, it was a flavor of the drink uh, oh. <laughs> when they went to the city, whatever it was. Oh, oh Archana said uh, thank you and send me the applications too. Um, I'll say the item application is on. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Fear, yep. hi. Um, I the application is um, online, right, Amishi? The kids. Pardon me? The application is online. Butter yes, so we have the option, or definitely the online option, but uh, you know, there are a few members who still want to do the paper. So I said, okay, that's fine too. So, uh, Mishi, they should email you because what I'm going to do is I'm going to post it for the students. I'm going to give it to the people here that are at the Center for Integral Health with us. And um, I'll also send it to you, so they should get it from you. Yes, I will do that. I will email so them. Let everyone know right what after. your email is. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that. Who should let I let know, know my... uh, what your email is, your email address? You mean the one, the list that you're going to send? Yes. No. Well, I'm going to send you those three paper, those three papers. Uh, okay. And so let everyone know what your email address is so they can uh, reach you. Okay. And they should have gotten the attendance thing from you so that maybe they already have it. But you maybe just mention it again. Sure, I will, I will uh, yeah, send it to the whole list again. Okay. Hey, Tim. Yes. This is Dale. Hi, Dale. Um, I, uh, I had uh, some extra notes that I had on the, um, to Salago, it was uh, part of the discussion I was having regarding posology. I don't know if uh, that would be something like uh, I should add at this point. Sure. All right, so <clears throat> here's what we discussed. Um, I think some of it goes without saying, but uh, potency-wise, um, their experience was uh, 12C for the more frail uh, or those who are immunocompromised, you know, to start with, elderly are at risk. Um, 30C for the more, you know, sort of typical, uh, relatively stable uh, vital force, doesn't matter what age. Uh, 200C for the very strong vital force. These are kind of basics, right? Uh, they were talking prophylaxis. Um, they, uh, at least what they seem to be using around the community is um, prophylactically. Now, this is regarding the Tusilago. I'm not, it's a pretty small remedy, but prophylactically, uh, 30C, two to three pellets uh, TID on day one, followed by. Um, two to three pellets one time per week, weekly. This is for prevention. For prevention, up to eight weeks of prophylactic intervention, yeah. I don't know where the eight weeks come from, that's just anecdotal. And I think what they're saying in some of the things is, you know, as long as it's in the environment, because some people are saying this attack, uh, this outbreak could last till May, June, some people are saying 18 months. 
I mean, in some of the influenza pandemics, it went from one year, it subsided, and then came back the next fall. Oh, so yeah. no one, anyone who says they own, they know certainly how it's going to go, it either has a crystal ball, they're psychic, or they're lying, or they're making right. it up. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, and for the acute phase onset, um, again, going back to your potency, 1230 or 200, depending on vital force, uh, two to three pellets, three times a day for the first three days, and then, you know, evaluate. So that's kind of where we were, where we ended our, our brief conversation about all this. When I was complaining about the headache, why I couldn't help people with the head pain, and then it kind of went from there to there to there. So I guess Good. that's all I have to say about that. Good. Thank you, Dale. That's useful. And uh, one more comment, and then we'll end. Um, Joe Prallo, uh, he made the comment that part of the reason the, the testing is a problem is it's a nasal pharyngeal swab. And the right. real problems are in the lung, so you can get, you know, false positive, false negative, because maybe there's not enough bug there. Maybe it's more in the lung. He said if we could biopsy everyone's lungs, we it would correlate better, but obviously we're not going to do that. So that's part of the reason why the testing is, is problematic at this point. Yeah, good point. Okay, so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thing, Joker, if you Go have ahead. time I'm for sorry. one more. Yes, um, just a quick mention of Echinacea Golden Seal because it's so popular and actually I have been taking it along with my whole family. Uh, do you actually recommend not taking it to avoid the cytokine um, storm? Lisa, that's your valley way. Yeah, Echinacea was on the yeah. list. Echinacea was on the list, yeah. Echinacea, mushroom, melatonin? No. Large and vitamin D. And Sambucus. I, I think it's theoretical, but uh, apparently maybe there are cases in the literature where people took a lot of it and had a problem. I don't know. But for this particular illness, probably we don't know. Autoimmune disease people are susceptible. Ah, so people with autoimmune disease are susceptible. So the uh, possibly unsafe with cytokine storm are Sambucus nigra or elderberry. Uh, extracts of mushrooms, medicinal uh, mushrooms, polysaccharide extracts, echinacea, uh, larch, and vitamin D. Um, and are you keeping are known to upregulate, uh, upregulate certain interleukins, which are known to be a problem in the inflammatory response of this, you know, the COVID disease, COVID-19 disease. But at the same time, the research shows that it upregulates positive cytokines, and it's all about balance. What's that? Um, What's that I, somebody asked me about the elderberry and cytokine storm, and I looked into it and said, yeah, it may upregulate the negative cytokines that are, you know, hard, that can be harmful, but it also upregulates positive cytokines that are definitely helpful, but it all depends on the individual and balance. Depends on the individual, yeah. And I think that's the thing, and this is kind of a theoretical because these things are laboratory yeah. and vitro tests would show it can do this or that, but what it happens in the individual patient, we don't know. But I think that's why you follow your patient and you, uh, you, uh, you see. And no, Jason, no. you have a question, I'll unmute you. You have to unmute that, there you go, go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, wondering if this is more in the lungs, why aren't we doing like a sputum test? Um, it's interesting. I'll show you the All right, cool. that I'm also going to post on the, on the, uh, um, I'm going to post this on Signet for the Home EFD3 students, and then you can share it with other students. Here's, this looks at how they get a virus from the different specimens. Uh, a lavage of the lungs is 93% positive. Sputum is 72%. But getting a good sputum specimen, having worked in the hospital, when people have pneumonia and you know they have probably pneumococcal pneumonia, try and get a positive sputum specimen. Very difficult. It's usually a waste of time. You have to, you have to send pulmonary in, they give them a, a, a albuterol treatment and they pound on their chest and then hopefully they cough up some green or yellow stuff that maybe you can call it the positive. But, but here it says 72% and nasal swab 
Uh, pharyngeal swabs are only 32%, and feces were 29%, and blood was only 1%. So, interesting. Good question, though. What's your source on that? Uh, this was, this is actually a medical student. <laughs> here's his picture. Oh, he compared, okay. uh, he looked at several articles, but here's the reference. This is from a JAMA study. This is the study. Uh, detection of SARS-CoV-2 in different types of clinical specimens. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here's another one where the correlation of CT with the PCR testing. Okay. Okay. We'll send, I'll send this, we'll send this to everyone. Ambitious medical student trying to make a name for himself in infectious disease, blah, blah, blah. Hey, are you familiar with Avigan? With who? Avigan. It's, a, it's an RNA polymerase inhibitor that's been used successfully for years in Japan that now the Chinese are using successfully in China. What's it called? Avigan. A-V-O-G-A-N? A-V-I. G-A-N. It's also called uh, favipiravir. Oh. So it's and, an antiviral. It's an antiviral. Yeah. Yeah. The Chinese have actually run a couple of studies. Um, one of my patients who used to work for Fuji Film was telling me about that. He's a Japanese man. He was saying he was involved. I said, Fuji Film, how'd they get involved in this? He said, well, you know, they're also a chemical company and he started telling me about it and I started researching it. And it's interesting, it's out there, it's available, it's been tested, the yellow fever, Ebola, and the Chinese are having some success in seroconversion uh, within four days. I know hydroxychloroquine is another thing that's being indicated, uh, but based on uh, uh, like 20 patients, 24 patients from France who were treated with it. And it was interesting, it was, um, non-randomized, unblinded study with hydroxychloroquine, and one French doctor felt it was useful because the viral load levels went down and the symptoms went, went better. But, I mean, that's Plaquenil. I know if long-term right. use, it causes blindness because it accumulates in the, in, the, um, in the retina. Yeah. Yeah. Retinitis. They say it's reversible, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, no, it's actually irreversible. Oh, it's, irre yeah, it's irreversible. They say it's rare, but once you have it, it's irreversible. Oh, so it's okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, Gail, could you spell the famofipavir for the audience just in case anybody wants to know? Do you have the spelling of the name? Me? Of the Avigan? The real uh, drug? The which one, the favipiravir or the Avigan? Both. Uh, Okay, A V like Victor, I G A N, Avi Avigan, and then the uh, Favipiravir, uh, F Frank A V Victor, I P I R A, and then V Victor I R, Favipiravir. It's also known as T, like Tango 705. Yeah. Obviously, probably none of us are going to be prescribing that, but the infectious disease doctors in the hospital are going to be using it. I saw that there were notes that they're trying all different types of antivirals. They're basically throwing stuff against the wall and see what sticks. So apparently, this is one of the ones that's sticking that seems to be having an a impact. Well, in China, they seem to they seem to like it, and they've uh, Japan has licensed it to them. They they had a small in study about 400 and some odd people where they had a control group and a, and a treatment group and the treatment group not only zero converted four days as opposed to say what 12 or 14 but they were able to demonstrate uh, ct changes you know lung ct changes as well we have to be careful because just finding viral loads and finding ct i mean those are zero good endpoints, it's really like mortality. Does it change mortality? Do patients really do better in the long run? Uh, you know, a lot of drugs, we do surrogate endpoints and, and it ends up looking good with the surrogate endpoints, but in the long-term data, it doesn't look so good. So, yeah, right. And, you know, a lot of these things are being prescribed on very scanty evidence to no evidence. 
But yeah. yet, why, why isn't homeopathy in the mix? I mean, I think we have better evidence from epidemics, and especially with influenza-like epidemics, that homeopathy should be a prime treatment, especially when there's no certain treatment. And it's a, we know it's safe. They're afraid to show any efficacy because then if the public were to see some efficacy and start to be interested in it, it, it would be a very big conflict for the medical profession and their supporting pharmaceutical industries. So, so you know, God forbid, I mean, just the, the same way if you're not a, a medical doctor and you don't, you want to treat cancer in anything but the conventional way, you can lose your right. license. I think in this particular case, they're trying to make it, um, you know, no, no to to say that, oh, gee, I can treat pneumonia and don't mention COVID, forget that. But, you know, they don't want to show any efficacy of homeopathy. It's not even in, the word is not even in the mix. Right? Yeah, which is, which which is, is unfortunate. Which is so but big. the AIH is trying to bring it up and, I mean, other organizations, India, when they announced their, their minister of Ayush minute, announce it and the prime minister of india is taking a homeopathic preventative for uh coronavirus they don't want anybody I mean, to know uh, that's Dale, not reported in the media here but that's the fact can i ask dale a question because he seems to be up on a lot of things here dale are you still there yeah i'm here okay do you know anything i heard of something that they were using i forgot where i don't have the information at hand that they were using vitamin c iv to show a lot of efficacy in helping people recover in china in China, I think in China, yeah. Would you tell people? Would you tell people to take buffered powdered vitamin C in high doses? They are. What about three here? grams or a day? Or three or grams a day. So four grams a day. Do, Absolutely. Three to five, three to five uh, grams a day, uh, right? I go to bowel tolerance. Uh, I know liposomal is supposed to be able to deliver higher doses. I've never taken it, but it's more pricey. But I think you can make it yourself. Jacinda, you're you're still unmuted. If you want to talk, yeah, I have a uh, some of the naturopaths were um, prescribing NAC, lysine, and ACEs with zinc. Would you say that that is also um, good to add with uh, as a prophylactic? So NA and and N acetylcysteine. Lysine, so those are two amino acids, apparently maybe interfere, like we know lysine has antiviral properties against herpes virus, so it's sort of like an antiviral. I don't know about NAC, and what was the last one? Um, ACEs with zinc, vitamin A, vitamin yeah. C, vitamin E. Yeah. Yeah. With zinc, yes, uh, definitely A, C, yeah. um, E, and uh, zinc. Yeah, those are other ones that people are recommending, absolutely. Zinc in pretty high doses though. Yeah. If you can tolerate it, again, that's to so stomach would, tolerance. I find if I take too much zinc, I get nausea. Especially on an empty stomach, I have to take it with food. Yeah. yeah. What would you consider a, a higher range for zinc? Because I, I know some people that are taking about 50 milligrams per day. Would you suggest higher? Okay. Um, up to 80 is what I'm seeing. Then you'd have to do probably split doses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a couple different. Metagenics has a product that's really easy to take high doses, and um, and it's very gentle on the GI tracts. Called Zinc AG. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, and at some point, if they're taking 80 up to 100 milligrams a day of zinc, hmm. usually once a week, you got to give them, you got to get them to throw a little copper in to balance it out. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Copper, you can use zinc is hard to get toxic on. Copper is the toxicity is similar to mercury. You have to be you have to be careful. You can go from a okay to, to have too much. And especially if you have any cancer or anything, copper is the last thing you want to be taking because the body uses copper to basically for angiogenesis, which if you have cancer, that's the last thing you want. Yeah, I agree. You have to be a little more careful with the copper than with the zinc. The zinc, I think you can throw a lot at a person and it's rare that someone has problems. And there's plenty of copper in the pipes, but you know, I just, I just bring it up. Usually two milligrams at once, once drink a week. Some tap water. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get your copper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, so, so zinc has been shown to be pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese medicine herbs out there too. Just as I mentioned, there's tons of them. They've been tested even for antiviral properties for, of coronavirus. There's articles on that. You can find a lot in the in the literature on that. Yeah, I think yeah. what I'm going to do now is I'll just unmute every un, unmute everyone, and uh, it doesn't work. But um, 
uh, mute the people that are left. And Bob, when is the next presentation? Uh, yes, good question. Uh, let's see here. The next July Homeopathic Association meeting will be Saturday, April 18, 10 a.m. So that's Chicago time, uh, Saturday, April 18, 1 a.m. Could be. We don't know where. We don't know location yet. It depends on what's going on. Um, I can certainly do the FDA thing. I didn't supposed to do this time. Uh, um, we might know more about it by then and then something else. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank 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 you. Tim, Tim.